Yeah. Amazing. Recording? Yeah. Amazing! Well, welcome back to the Serrated Empire. Um, we had a session two weeks ago now. Um, well, slightly under on the Monday. Where we established our character, sorted out character sheets and bits and pieces. I'm fully expecting and completely cool with um, people switching stuff around or need to fix sure we'll, we'll find stuff that we'd forgotten or what have you. Um, I gave myself a good few hours of planning time today and then I got into it and I was like, holy shit, this isn't enough time. So there's still a lot of stuff for me to do, but that's fine. We will begin with a little preamble. The year is 798 PE, post-Exodus. The month is the month of Fulsin, and the great moon, Sina, hangs ever-present in the sky. A reminder that she watches over us all, no matter where you are on the surface of Arkivia. It is a flowers day, one of the days of the week in Arkivia. The 14th day of the month, and each of you wakes from a fitful sleep. We're going to begin, because I can't resist. <laughs> I have so many questions already. Actually, no. Let's let's start this off simpler. We're going to begin with Tiberius. Tiberius, what do you think <clears throat> you were dreaming of? You had a, a fitful slumber. What kinds of things does Tiberius care for? What kinds of things do you think he dreams of on the regular? It better not be like my dream last night, I'll tell you that much. Um, oh, God. I dreamt that... For some reason, I told people that I was dating Hannah, and they were like, what was it? And they were like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, I'm getting married. And then I had to tell this to everyone. And I was like, but you know I'm getting married. And it's like, yeah, but we didn't know you're dating. It was weird. And... <laughs> that sounds so stupid. But I think Tiberius would dream mostly of himself becoming a big shot. Well, as big a shot you can get in this place because he doesn't really have anything to compare that to when you've only got a small, shitty little place. Yep. You, the biggest dream you can have is being a hero to everyone in that place. Absolutely. And I guess he's probably read, I guess there's sc manuscripts and books lying about that um, he's probably read about Hespia and it might seem as, like it's dreamland. So if he ever dreamed of what the outside world might be like. He might think it's like rife with all these beautiful things that he's never seen. I love so that. So basically dreaming of living in a better place, but wanting to make this place like his dream. Yeah. Perfect. And in your dream, Tiberius, you've read all about the capital city of South Hespia, Crucible, Perfect for your needs. The great stage in the center of Crucible. Crowds of adoring onlookers gazing down upon you as you speak your words of truth and excitement and they raise you up. And you're, you smile in your dream. Your sleeping self rolls to one side, happy in the knowledge that you are finally getting the recognition you deserve. I would also say... You can't really imagine that many people because, well, <laughs> if you've got a settlement of 100 people, what's 1,000 people look like? What's yeah. 30,000 people look like? Uh, I was working, <laughs> I figured out who survived and everything. I worked out that there were 45 people still from the original um, voyage and that the, the current population of New Quivershank is somewhere in the region of just under 100. So, yeah, it's like nothing. Um... So yeah, in your dream, perhaps 200 people are gazing down upon you and it's quite the metropolis. But your smile turns to a frown in your sleep as a creeping mist begins to sift down from the high ranks of the, the Hespian um, Crucible Arena and you feel your feet sinking down into thick, sticky mud. Now you're very used to mud. New Quivershank is a bathed in it in but mood. this has a in the mood this has almost a, an acrid acidic nature to it and you can feel a pain beginning to tingle almost like a, a stronger pins and needles in your feet 
everything else is the same. The people are still gazing down, though slowly being obscured by this falling mist. And you can feel yourself in your dreams sinking, sinking into this thick, swampy ooze. What would Tiberius do in his dream? He wouldn't listen to advice where stand still and just think slower. He'd just writhe around as much as he could trying to escape it. Amazing. You frantically writhe around and any onlookers to, to Tiberius' slumber would see his limbs thrashing about slightly in his sleep and suddenly you awake and the day is ahead of you. What do you see Tiberius doing on his average day in, in New Quivershank? Mostly dressed in his best regalia, going around town, sing songs at people, hoping to get some money out of them. Um, just just being a waster, basically. Drinking at this at, um, Pushkin's place, um, shouting at the child's children in the <laughs> tower of a child. Um, Incredible. Not, not much. More than, more than I'd do if I didn't have a job. <laughs> And what would people see as, as Tiberius goes around? You said in his finest regalia, what kind of a, a visage does does Tiberius strike? Whatever he could have afforded, basically. Because I know clothes, clothing is scarce at this mm-hmm. place. So maybe, I don't know, hand-me-downs from um, the wealthier people here. Yep. But I imagine what a dice like. I imagine there's not many dies, right? Yeah, very few and far between. There is um, a weaver here. Um, there's no proper tailor, but rudimentary garments have been made for those. Um, but there is a lot of kind of make do amend repairing um, some basic flower based dyes, but they are weak. So you get sort of pale colors coming through. And apart from that, it's just your, your poorly kind of woven materials. So what dye is the most expensive? Uh, I would say probably a deep blue coming from some beetles. Then he'd be wearing as much deep blue as possible. <laughs> um, he'd basically be peacocking around. He's got a very... Um, he's got oily hair that's tied back. Um, slap, I don't know what oil we might have here to slather on his hair so he looks more... Sh- it's got a good sheen to it. It's got a very well, well, if he as well trimmed as the tools here would allow. Beard. Yep. Um. Very good. Just trying to think of anything else. Let me just. He carries an instrument with him. I think so. Is a a lute. Yes, a lute. Amazing. Yeah. No. There's for such a, a rundown settlement. Um, you're absolutely right in terms of clothes, but there's actually been a fairly decent amount of the kind of artistic tools kept between um, Salas himself and his little commune of artists um, and the old Lord Quivershank um, traveling across and devoting quite a lot of um, cargo space to some of his musical instruments and bits and pieces. Um, There's actually quite a lot around. So I think um, Tiberius probably could have got a loot from um, Lord Ernst Quivershank. Yeah, and he'd be strumming that thing as hard as he could at people. He'd probably be, because of how much he's played, mm-hmm. he's probably equivalent of um, George at guitar, but <laughs> he thinks he's way better than George at guitar. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I am way better than George at guitar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. Well, but now... May I we're ask gonna... something? Oh, of course. What relation is Tiberius to the Lord Quivershank, and who's his mother? Well, you don't know that. Okay. But his mother... I don't know that, to be honest, but his mother is <laughs> blind, right? Or deaf? She's deaf. His That's mother it. is deaf, yep. He, Your character would know he is the son. Okay. Or he thinks he's the son. And I, I'm leaving it up to Tom whether... There's any actual relation, or because yeah. I don't mind, it doesn't really affect him. Yeah, Tiberius awesome. proudly states his his heritage. Um, uh, his yeah, his mother is um deaf. She is scrolling through. 
Um, she was one of the original um, travellers on the Quiver Sail. Um, she's now quite old. Um, a citizen who passes her time with small kind of uh, plant-based crafts, working with whatever's available to her. Whittling's very pop popular in New Quivershank because there's still a decent amount of kind of bladed metal materials and a lot of wood from the, the jungle. Um, in terms of the, the Lord, if anyone asked or was particularly interested in the whether Tiberius was related to the Lord, the Lord would kind of laugh things off and essentially dodge any questions coming his way. But the Lord's quite nice. like that in general. He's very... <laughs> eccentric and prone to just dipping out of a conversation or starting a new one halfway through a conversation. <clears throat> there we go. Awesome. We're going we're going to leave Tiberius for now. We will return. And instead, I would like to zoom over to our lovely Lorcor Olibim. E. What do you imagine Lorcor? Well, actually, I, and I forgot to ask this for Tiberius. Um, so, Kieran, one last thing. Where do you see Tiberius um, sleeping? Does he stay with his mother? Does he try and sleep in other people's homes? He would have the Lothario next door to his mother, asserting <laughs> his independence. Living in the garage <laughs> tent mode. I love it. Um, then Lorcor, where would, um, if we were zooming over to, to see Lorcor slumbering away, where do you imagine um, Lorcor sleeping? Lorcor, well, it depends. Who, who, who took um, care of him again? This is Foot Cane. She is a still um, quite similar to how she was, long dwarven life, um, a grizzled and fairly grumpy um, guard. Um, she still thinks of herself as a guard, even though really there isn't any mu anything much done in terms of guarding here in New Quivershank. Um, but she has a tent. She lives in the North Runs, near Chuck's Garden and Well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, he wouldn't he wouldn't live with her anymore. But I think he'd be a recent move out. And if you if you watched him waking up, he'd be <clears throat> rising off of the hard ground because he doesn't. I think beds are strong enough for him. He's just like, ah, I could be. Uh, they make me stronger if I sleep on the floor. <coughs> Amazing. <coughs> uh, what do you imagine Lorco dreaming of? Probably uh, killing stuff with his teeth. Going hunting. Oh, very cool. Uh -huh. so, hunting through the thick jungle surroundings, the, s the smell, the sense of prey nearby nostrils flaring teeth glistening in the moonlight perhaps and as your your um hands reach out to grasp what you're hunting some small prey animal you're ready to have a delicious dinner the prey disappears into a, a thick mist which seems to loom in front of you like a wall just slowly expanding the wispy edges of the this mist wall coming towards you, enveloping the trees next to you. How would Lorcor react in his dream? Probably growl at the mist and start, like, scratching at it. No. Nice. Right. <sighs> Growling and swiping. The mist does come apart with your swipes. Your arms pass through the mist, billows out, and you get glimpses of the vegetation beyond, but... With a sick inevitability, the mist thickens and it begins to envelop your arms and your face down your throat, this cloying, choking mist. And you realize as you start to move and try and pull away that your feet have become deeply embedded in a thick, swampy mud. And Lorcor awakes, startled somewhat, on the hard floor, ready to start the day. What does an average day look like for Lorcor? <coughs> uh, depends if any hunting needs doing. If hunting needs doing, he'll go out. Um... Hunting is strictly um, controlled by the Sari. Mm -hmm. However, there is a lot of, um, I guess we'd call it poaching or similar, where people sneak out to hunt when they're actually not allowed to. 
The oh. Sari essentially allow a quota, it's, and it's a measly number of animals to be hunted by the citizens of New Quivershank, because the Sari strictly control how much of an impact the citizens have on nature around um, this island. So it would, yeah. it essentially becomes a kind of um, whoever can persuade or shout loudest, which I imagine Lorca was quite good at, um, to say like, me, me, let me go hunt to the Sari each day. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah. you, you and gather... he's probably sneaking out as well, to be fair. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. So, Lor and others would definitely notice Lorca, I'm sure. Tall in stature and broad. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yep, a lizard folk of which Lorcor is the only uh, lizard folk in New Quivershank. Um, so I have given, I have, oh, sorry, I have given him a thing where he um, is pretty good at stealth. Um, oh, very cool. Oh, I remember, remember this. this. Yes, yes, with his um, his scales, his skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Unseen kind of blended. lizard folk. And That's they awesome. Blend in with your surroundings and stuff. Well, then I imagine he's quite successful with his hunting. Um. That leads me on to a, an interesting question. When Lorcor hunts, obviously there's the thrill there for himself. Um, but does he is he doing it to provide for others? Is he interested in like um, trading off his his hunted prey for other goods and things like that? What what drives him in his hunting? He just likes doing it. It's kind of a feeding people. It's kind of a secondary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, just takes his fill and he's like, ah, oh, you can have the scraps. There you go. Okay. Um, cool. That answers my questions. Very good. Um, we will then uh, swing on over. I've been waiting for this moment. To the sleeping, slumbering form of Slug Nilly. Um, Slug, where do you sleep? Are you in a, a tent with your family? Yeah, of course. Yeah? And and who who makes up Slug's family? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, remember now? Well, I remember he had he has parents, but then I'm... Now I'm thinking maybe he should have brothers and sisters, but... Mm, no, it's just parents. Just parents? Yeah. Very cool. Um, does he get on with his parents? Well, only a, a little bit. They're fine. <laughs> Fair I enough. imagine his dad is like a lumber guy. Yep. And Perfect. his and his mum is like a a cook. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. There's a lot of efforts to to spice up the cuisine in the village, seeing as the food stuff is so often mushroom based, and people get real sick of it scraps of meat um, that they can barter for or steal from others um, but very good and what do you imagine um, Slug dreams of? Um, treasure Amazing yeah. Finding treasure Swimming around in treasure Any particular kind of treasure? Are we talking money? Yeah, box of gold Box of gold Incredible so you find yourself in your dream, Slug, sat plonked down happily on your butt with a beautiful, large, ornate wooden box of gold. It glimmers and shines almost like the sun itself, high fire, is rising out of uh, the box, just blinding you. But you can reach in and you feel the coins and, and different pieces like a golden chalice and uh, golden face, a big head, a bust of, of pure gold, and the gold is warm, and it's just wonderful. No one else around to take it or get in the way, just you and your treasure. But as you reach down into the gold, <laughs> moving your hands around inside of the box, you see this thick white mist begin to boil up out of the chest, over your arms, out and around the box itself, and begin to fill this dream space you're in. How would Slug react? I'll run away. You get up, dislodging your hands from the gold, leaving it behind you, turn tail, and run. And run and run. 
but you find that the the mist keeps up with you and your your legs become slower as you look down and this blank dreamscape now instead looks like the the jungle floor so close outside the palisade wall of new quivershank and the mud is thick and sticky and as you run and pull your legs out of the the mud you splash further into swampier swampier water and the mist encloses you from behind and you wake in your bed or on your bed roll how do you imagine um slug spends his average day in new quivershank mm. he'd be helping his mum with the cooking Aww. chopping mushrooms and stuff but he doesn't like it he just is made to do it <laughs> otherwise he would be hanging out with the other little uh, kids ah perfect you know causing trouble <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, there is a, um, a, what's the word I want to look for? Explosive rivalry, because the most uh, common uh, members of the Sari who who look over New Quivershank from their three towers are the children. The tower of the Sari um, at, to the further north and the Tower of the Elder are only ever really occupied by one person each. But the Tower of the Child often has a bundle of kids who are kind of looking out, pointing down at various residents, chattering and giggling amongst themselves. Um, and I can imagine Slug with his little gang of of New Quevershank citizen kids. Um, they'd probably have something to say about that. Yeah, they don't like them. Yeah, they don't like them at all. Um, and the other kids definitely look up to you. Does Slug, with his um, magical powers, does he show them off? Or does he keep them secret? Yeah, he shows them off. Oh, incredible. That's so how you get his street cred. <laughs> yeah. And as the de facto leader, as the only one with, with innate magical abilities, and especially at such a young age, the other kids look up to you um, with awe and follow you around each day. Um, even with your your mother getting you to chop the mushrooms and make your bed roll and all of that, you can hear the sounds of your your mates outside calling for Slug to come outside and and start their day. Fantastic! Thank you so much. Right, but now we will zoom on over to our final <laughs> and perhaps strangest member of the crew. Where does Henry Mush sleep? Does Henry Mush sleep at all? I think he just sits in Chuck's garden. Just uh -huh. like, just sits upright. Just sits there amongst the other vegetables and whatever he grows in there. Yeah, just peacefully sits. Yeah. And, and do you think Henry Mush dreams? I think he dreams of... You know when you like people tell you to picture an apple in your mind's eye? Mm -hmm. and he just like sees an apple like spinning in his mind eye that as it spins round it slowly becomes swollen cankerous cracked and discoloured mm. until he awakens very cool the apple in your mind's eye spins it goes through its usual process and you see the beauty, the mould the skin splitting and shriveling as decay overtakes um, this apple. But as it splits and cracks apart almost from inside like the yolk of an egg running out um, a thick white mist begins to envelop it and actually um, for Henry Mush you notice that where the mist touches on the apple the body of it seems to rejuvenate slightly, as if undoing or rewinding the decay across itself. Parts of the apple, too far gone before the mist gets to them, still fall, and you hear the little parts plopping into thick, slimy water that you now notice on the ground below the apple. How does Henry Mush react to this mist and slime? I think he'd, like, rub it all over himself. Like, the mist itself? Yeah, he'd like play in it like a, a a child plays in the wind with like dandelions. Oh, amazing. Yeah, you, you take the apple and the mist boiling ever thicker out of this fruit 
um, spills over you, and where it touches your skin, you feel a, a tingling sensation, like ice cold range playing out across your um, fungus skin. And uh, the mist boils all around, and it begins to enclose more and more. And you hear sound not unlike the sound of waves breaking against the shore that that rhythmic whooshing sound but this sounds more closer to wind uh, rushing through a cave and the beginnings of, of a voice begin to play through it it just whispers Henry as it plays through <laughs> yeah. and you awake <laughs> you awake gently in the morning with a feeling refreshed from your dream. Fantastic. You are all awaking on the same day. Um, oh, sorry, Henry. Mush, what, could you describe what people would see <laughs> as you moved around? I also didn't do this for Slug. Yeah. We're going back to Slug in a sec. So get um, ready, George. But Henry first. They'd probably just on one side see this um, fungal growth that's developed into half a fungal mushroom-like mm. man with a distinctly happy smiley face on the front of it um <laughs> that people probably watch with quite a lot of caution and fear but <laughs> also he is friendly so they're just like hi <laughs> kind of. and then on the other side you see the i don't know if she's a corpse or if she's barely sort of just hanging on for base <laughs> sustenance but uh, the soul, the eye, like the black soulless eyes of a, um, an old woman who is the host of Henry Mish, which is infection, which is kind of does like she, it's dragged along. Does she move of her own accord so he's not dragging her along, or is she like like it kind of like a zombie? So it's a walking bit like, beside, a bit like a zombie, I think. Okay. Incredible. Um <laughs> so good. And uh Slug, Slug Nilly, can can uh, we have a, a little description? What would people see? Obviously followed by his gang of grubby reprobates and street smart kids. Um what but what does um Slug look like running along at the head of the gang? Ah, uh, uh he's got puffy hair. He's got in a work waistcoat, it's got his cool slug insignia <laughs> on it. Painted that on. He's got. Uh... What, what's painted on what? Sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, his slug insignia. Slug insignia, incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on his waistcoat. Yep. <laughs> and he, he sort of strolls around. He's a little bit. Um... Yeah, just roaming around, you know. He's got his stick. Yeah, sometimes he has a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so good, amazing. To but be we fair, see that... Gandalf's staff is called a walking stick, so less, <laughs> less is more. <laughs> so we see this puffy-haired, slug insignia'd um, kid leading this gang of ne'er do wells around. I'm sure getting up to all sorts of mischief, throwing things at people and running away. Yeah, love throwing things at people. Incredible, fantastic. Um, so, we will zoom back. We're going to get a little bit more insight into people's, uh, our characters here. Tiberius. Mm -hmm. On this day, um, you're ready to head off and start going about um, thinking about perhaps where best, who you, you've seen, you, who you haven't visited for a while to try and get a, a favor or a, a bit of goods from with your playing. Um, you make your decision and, and head out, but on the way, you hear a familiar voice. An angry, high-pitched um, shriek of a voice of a teenage, young teenage Sari boy from atop the Tower of the Child, screeching down at you. And he doesn't know your name properly, but he does seem to have taken a particular hatred towards you. And from listening out and asking his companions, he just calls you Tybee. And he just points down from on top of the tower and he just says, Tybee! Tybee shit! 
tie me shit! And he points to his friends, points down at you, and they all just laugh down at you, Tiberius. How do you react? He's gonna, he's gonna spread his legs apart, thrust his chest out. Yep. He's like, actually, um, <clears throat> is Tiberius Quivershank my fetid little friend? I, uh, I wouldn't expect you to be able to speak properly, not being from a proper culture. And he looks around, seeing if anyone else in the town's responded to his retort. Yeah, there's a couple of people nearby beginning their day, um, uh, perhaps even setting up their stool in Little Crucible, and one of them gives you a, a, a nod of support. Um, the other one just kind of rolls their eyes and goes back to doing what they're doing. Um, there's a pregnant pause up in the tower, as the kids seem to be conferring. Two more of the Sari children press themselves against the, the wooden railing at the top of the tower and point down at you. And in a brutal unison, almost as if they've been practicing, they all just start chanting, Ty be shit! Ty be ugly! Ty be stupid! Ty be shit! Ty be ugly! And it just keeps on going. How does Tiberius react? Is there like a dividing line between um the... Well, the half settlement. No, there is uh, a line in so far as you can see on the map. The the area considered New Quivershank is all heavily trodden and worked up into a mud, whereas the the Sari side is kept with a thin grass um, and the occasional paths. But no, there's no um, restraint or physical division at all. Gonna, it's going to take a few steps towards what he believes is the dividing line and put mm. his one foot, he's going to put it out and he's going to touch his toe on the other side. The, the kids do gasp. <gasps> and that many of them point down and chatter, no longer calling out the, their mocking version of your name, but instead chattering in sari. One of them looks horrified and begins to scramble back towards the two other towers. But um, the sari boy that you've managed to figure out, because this one really, really seems to hate you, um, is called Moki, um, actually places a, a, a grasping hand on the shoulder of the other child to stop them calling for help, and begins to climb down the tower. Moki does. Okay. You're in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> the right, other kids, <laughs> watch take, on. He'll, yeah, he'll, go take on. A step. he'll take a full step over as he sees this kid. Oh. Other kid, the other kids above, chattering excitedly. One of them um, actually like throws a small um, piece, an apple core, consumed piece of fruit down towards you, Tiberius. Tiberius is going to be stupid. Mm -hmm. He's going to take his loot out and try and bat it back at. Amazing. Go ahead and make a. Oh God, yeah, a. Um... A dexterity check, roll dexterity. Unless you can think of something else. That's absolutely enough. You swing with your faithful loot and with a cringe slightly at the, the horrible discordant twang of the strings as it's hit by the, the mass of the fruit, but it's not too heavy. And it actually I'm gonna roll for this. Evens and odds. And as he does it, he nice. says it's like we don't want your poisoned fruit over here <laughs> perfect and on the on the emphasis on poisoned you strike the fruit and it manages to hold together and it goes flying back up and clonks into the child he goes tumbling back into the the top part of the tower and the others are just like <clears throat> and there's some angry shouting from up the top moki in the meantime gets to the bottom you see him dressed in traditional sari um gear very little in terms of uh covering he's got a simple set of um leather work breeches only going down to the knees um his um torso is completely covered in um the beginnings of sari tattoo work starting to to expand out from um, particular focal points like the joints the elbows the shoulders and so on and alongside various bits of, of war paint-like um, decorations. Graggly black hair. He looks like he is 
orcish and ancestry. Um, pretty big for a, a young teenager, um, but still shorter than you, though perhaps a little bit broader in the shoulder. Um, and he is just making a beeline for you. He squared his shoulders and he's just saying, Tybee, shit! Tybee, shit! And is making his way towards you. Does Tiberius stand his ground? Yeah, he's going to stand there. He's going to go more into his power phase, thrusting out his hips and chest. Okay. <laughs> There's definitely a, a small crowd, which in New Kivoshenk is like four people, um, who have gathered around now and are watching on and muttering. She's like, what's he doing? This, this isn't a good idea. A little upset. The sorry. Moki strides up to you and just goes to shove you, Tiberius. Absolutely goes to shove you. Um, we'll just try and dodge you out of the way. Okay. If you want to roll a reflex save for me. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. I'll use a hero point. <laughs> you will. And I'd like to remind everyone everyone has one hero point currently. We always begin the sessions with one hero point. to adjust my thing. Ooh, a 19 definitely beats his athletics if, DC. If he does that, mm -hmm. can, he, can he just, as, as he goes past, can you just give him like a soft shove so he, he falls over? Absolutely. Um, More like just using his weight against him. Oh, completely. And Moki really has thrown his shoulders into this. He goes for an obvious two-handed shove, squared shoulders. Tiberius, you nimbly step to the side, and with a little nudge from your elbow, Moki goes stumbling and skidding into the mud of New Quivershank itself, over the line. So into serious, the just, area. He just cocks his head back. He's like... <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You're a little shit now, aren't you? <laughs> Moki, furious, rolls onto his back and you see angry tears in his eyes and mud over his face um, that's wiped off a lot of the war paint that was there. A cavalcade of various small bits of food and wood and tokens begin <laughs> flying down towards you, Tiberius, from the top of the tower as the other Sari children seem to be backing up their fallen comrade. Um... Moki himself, like a, a raging bull, goes even more clumsy this time, just stumbling towards you, tears streaming down his cheeks, cutting through the mud as he's going to try and just like rugby tackle you um, towards the ground. Uh, we'll try and dodge you out of the way again. Fantastic. Yep. Another reflex saving throw for me, please. A oh. lower DC this time. That's more than enough. Um, but would you like to further humiliate Moki, or are you just moving out of the way? He just moves out of the way. I'm just like, why don't you fuck off back to your tower, you little prick? Moki stumbles past, skidding to his knees, grass stains, um, caking his lower legs. He gets back up, and he just, with a teary, angry voice, just goes, Moki, stupid, uh, ooh, Tybee, stupid, and then goes running off towards and past the tower, towards the tower of the Sari. He just, he does a little wave to the kids in the tower, and he just shouts after the kids, like, see you later, shipstone. <laughs> <laughs> They've run out of things to throw at this point, and there's a hushed silence, but you can see the form of Moki disappearing, running off towards the Tower of the Sari, where you know there is always an adult warrior staying. Yeah, he's just going to get out his loot and start playing. There once was a child, his name was Moki, but everyone thought he was a bit of a jokey. <laughs> and then, like, um, walk, walk off to the poor of Pushkin. Perfect. And the four, three out of the four people nearby clap loudly. One of them has a little fist pump in the air. She's like, yeah, you showed those, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. The child just embarrassed himself. How could he possibly, possibly try and take on a quiver shank? Well, damn right. Uh, but um, he kind of glances over your shoulder towards the, the larger tower of the sari. The little small figure of Moki move, running towards it. You might want to make yourself scarce, though, and uh, you're going to need to defend yourself. But it made me feel a bit of pride to be a, a, a new quiver shanky in today, so uh, please, take this. And he pulls out a fairly um, rusty-looking dagger and hands it um, handle first towards you, Tiberius. 
he'd take it and he'd be like, why would I need to worry, my good man? I barely touched touch the child. He embarrassed himself more than, well, me doing anything to him. Oh, wow. He just gives him a shit smile. <laughs> the guy gives a supporting smile back, but you can see there's worry in his features and the other... Uh, three people have since dispersed and made themselves scarce um, as Tiberius heads on into the poorer Pushkin. Fantastic. We switch over now, following our previous pattern. To... I, did it, I did it, everyone. I embarrassed a child. <laughs> yeah, woo! <laughs> Hero! Um, we switch, uh, following our previous pattern, over to Lorcor now. Lorcor is your... Um, you went out to try and uh, bid with your voice for some legal, if you like, um, permit to, to go hunting. But to no avail, I'm afraid you were shouted down by a particularly large gif. And there's large hippo-like creatures, bellowing voice. You know this man to be Ignis Sutclench. Um, quite the um, boisterous braggart about town who likes to who likes to hunt and likes to push people around. Um, he managed to shout down the rest. Would Lorcor have openly opposed Ignis or, or reacted in that situation? No, I assume that that kind of happens on the daily. So. Yep. It's, yeah, so it's, it's very yeah. much uh, who can get the best spot to shout from, who shouts the loudest. It, it comes and goes. Um, and as you head back um, to your tent, uh, you see your your adoptive mother, Thut Kane, um, the grizzled features, um, black hair back, kept fairly short, but enough length to have a, a very tightly wound with a piece of leather cord, um, short um, ponytail, streaks of grey in her hair. She's gathering um, her equipment. She still takes her guard duties very seriously, despite how many of the other previous guards of the settlement have since just given up entirely. Um, but she hasn't, and she she polishes her weapons, um, a keen-edged um, dwarven battle axe, um, a short bow, um, a number of arrows, though diminished from their previous number now. There is a Fletcher in New Quivershank, but she is um, struggles to keep up with how much is needed for everyone. Um, but as you come back towards uh, your adoptive mother, she looks up and does... does Lorcor go by Lorcor Oli Bim, or does he mind what he's called? He doesn't mind his mum doing it. Yeah. yeah. So I think your mother would um, not want for cutesy uh, nicknames, but would just address you as Lorcor. She would look up and say, um, just kind of take you in for a moment. You can see there's a wistful look in her eyes, and she'd say to you, Lorcor, um, Guys, it's been a long time since that that voyage, Lorcor. I know you never really got to to meet Krez. Um but sometimes uh she looks around at the the delinquent, the dilapidated elements of the settlement. Sometimes I wonder if she had the right idea heading off with Salia and the rest of them. I wonder how they're doing now. <laughs> Well, you don't need to worry, because I'll just be a heading when I see her for you. Yeah, an immediate smile cracks her, her grim, um, stoic demeanour. And Thut Kane looks up at your towering form, takes in your, your strongly muscled shoulders and arms, your preferred weapon and your muscular tail, the thick scales across your back, and kind of nods slowly as like, you know, I... I think you just might, Lorcor, if you do meet her, but um, she wouldn't be alone. She may not even be alive still. She was fairly old when mm. she left um, with the sari breathing down our necks. I know there's not much we can do here. Can't help but wonder if wherever they ended up settling, if things aren't better, if they're allowed to, you know actually do things actually hunt when they want actually build more take what they need it's not like we're asking much she kind of glares angrily towards the sorry side of the settlement he gives a growl as well and sort of looks in the sort of same direction it's like 
Oh, I'm sick of them taking our stuff, mother. Ah, oh, God, I wish I could just beat them. Beat them down now. Well, I think we probably could take the ones that are here, but that's not the problem. It would just be the horror that could be coming down on us afterwards, but... You keep uh, reminding me. What's that? Just keep reminding him. Yeah. Mm. No. Doesn't suit me, Dorkor. I know it doesn't suit you either. I feel like a a plant trying to grow in a pot that's too small. There's nothing I can do. I've still got plenty of years left to me. Spend my days walking the palisade walls. Nothing to look at, really. Nothing new to do. I know some, and she kind of glances uh, up towards the Fixer's compound, which is a smaller palisaded area where the people who identify themselves as the Fixers gather. You know, Lorcor, as does everyone here, that these people gather a lot of different goods. They they deal in favours, gambling. Um, they run various rackets in the settlement. There's a lot of stuff that goes unseen by the Sari and often by other citizens. Um, Lorcor would have definitely been approached by the Fixers at some point, asking if he was interested in um, coming on board, being a Fixer himself, and maybe throwing some of that muscle around. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think Lorcor would have reacted at the time? Mm -hmm. If Mother approves, he probably would have done it, yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. Mother would definitely not. Um, but Kane, <laughs> if if Lorco sort of came back and said, oh, I've been asked, she would have spat on the ground and said, don't you have anything to do with those fixers? They're looking to take advantage of people, and that's not what we're here to do. Oh, no one takes advantage of me. You're damn right. <laughs> she kind of stands up and pats you on the back. Lorcor, barely reaching up to your shoulder, your big shoulder blades. She says, well, I'm going to go do the walk. If no one does it, you never know what might end up happening. You look after yourself. I um, heard um, Pushkin's going to uh, have a little celebration. We're coming up or round about 30 years, 60 cycles. Well, can't even think of it myself. Round about 60 cycles now since... Uh, founding, so you might mm -hmm. want to swing by there later on. You you stay safe as well, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll go and have a look. Oh, I can't think of what they're celebrating down there. Wow. Should be a bit of fun, I think. It's always mm -hmm. nice seeing Pushkin. Got us through some tough times when we on our voyage over. Right, see you later. She gives you a smile kind of grasps your forearm, gives it a squeeze for a second, and she heads off, whistling to herself, does begin her walk around the palisade wall. Yeah. Gives her a squish it. back. Loves his mum. Yeah. Amazing. Right. We'll zoom over <laughs> to Slug. So, your day has begun, Slug. You've managed to get through your chores. Your, your father's already off at the lumber mill. And yard chopping away. Your mother's happy that you've done enough um, to get through. Um, you head out, and there's not many citizens here, so you've got kind of slim pickings for your little gang. You've probably got a, a, like a six-year-old running along <coughs> beside your grubby little orcish urchin. Uh, one of the success stories of the of New Quivershank is the Burn Hammer family, or now the Burn Hammer Rush family. Um, who have who have had quite a few children and the family's kind of thriving. Um, so you'd have a little um, six-year-old orcish lad running along with you, um, a couple of preteens perhaps, and a surly, probably a little bit older than you, maybe 16, um, a surly half-elf um, teen uh, with big floppy blonde hair down over... Um, his face likes to carry around this nasty looking um, well-worn piece of wood like a club and essentially acts as your bodyguard or enforcer. Um, and the two uh, preteens, as you come out from your, your family's tent, just say, um, 
Well, uh, what are we going to do today, Slug? Well, we better work on the den, isn't it? Because where are we going to keep all the treasure? Oh, no smart, Slug. Uh, sh should we all go to the den, or should we try and nick some more, some more goodies? Well, who has any goodies? I've not seen any goodies. The little six-year-old um, chimes in. God, I'm going to try and do a high voice. <laughs> Puts his little hand up. Uh, my, my mum and granny, they don't always watch the, the goods out back in the box. We could take some of that, maybe. <laughs> yeah, nice. No, that's a good plan, actually. Let's uh, go grab some. What goods? What are they? Uh, nails? Well, uh, that would... Daggers? Oh, daggers. Yeah. Yeah, let's get let's get some daggers. <laughs> Amazing. The little crew goes scampering <laughs> off towards um the blacksmith, which is right alongside uh, the lumber mill, the smaller building there. Um What's the plan of attack? Does, does Slug have any um, tricks up his sleeve or uh, any instructions for his crew? You can see the box out back, just as the little one said. Um, you can see uh, the top of the box is um, not sealed. It's kind of a slightly um, ajar and not set properly. You can hear the sound of hammer on anvil, um, working metal, and the, the bellows, the grunts of strong... Um, bodies work in the bellows and the roar of the fire inside as they they start early um, in the blacksmith but is there a particular plan or are you just going to run up and grab some stuff oh plan eh well hmm, better I reckon we should make a distraction what about if someone goes over and uh, pushes someone over not me, I'm not being pushed over, but someone else could be pushed over and I could grab the dagger. The two um, preteens look at each other and their hands shoot up and they're just like, oh, oh yes, sl Slug, we could do it. Yeah, I think you could do it. You're pretty good. Oh, I'll be the pusher. And the other one starts arguing, no, I, I want to be the pusher. Nah, you're the pusher. You're the pushy. One slumps its shoulders. The the older, the surly teen leans over and is just like, yeah, pushy. And the two preteens nervously glance. And then they head out, scampering to the front of the the blacksmith. Um, it does have an open front to it to help um, get rid of all the excess heat, make it a bit more bearable. So the, the, black, the people working in the blacksmith, the Orcish family, kind of glance up as, the, as these two begin to make a scene. They're shouting and pushing at each other. One's like, you took my breakfast. And the other one's like, no, it was all my breakfast. And they push one. And the one goes skidding across the ground. Slug going to try and make a move? No, he's going to send that little boy. Oh, <laughs> you send the little six-year-old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he beams being given this responsibility. He's like, oh, I won't let you down. Goes scampering off. I'm just going to uh, make this... Uh, well, in fact, just roll a straight d20 for me. Oh, yeah, I can do. Got a DC in mind. What? Giving Slug a child gang was so good. <laughs> <laughs> Got to work out all the names now. It's going to be great. Um, go scampering up. You see him kind of stumble for a second, skid in the mud a little bit. He kind of does that thing that kids do where they have to stand back up by pushing down with their hands. Just like, uh, kind of <laughs> toddles leaning back slightly but looks back at you and gives you a little toothy grin and a little thumb up in the air goes running on again he's it looks like he's not big enough to reach into the box what are you gonna do oh shit not big enough not big enough uh he's got his little hands on the edge of the box he's like running against the side of the box trying to pull himself up into it but he's a little kid that's not very good. Uh, can I try and lift a dagger out of the box with my mind powers, please? 
Oh, absolutely. Is this a, a particular spell? It's a cantrip called Mage Hand. Oh, incredible. So, you focus. How does how do you imagine Slug manifesting his powers? Is it through the staff? Is it from, yeah, like you think his mind? Yeah, he, he puts his hand up to his head and he yep. uses his mind powers. Oh, as you do so, the the surly um, older team next to you takes a step back and is the jaw, like the mouth opens as he just kind of watches you like, whoa. Slug stands there, hand on head, focusing, and the little kid falls down from the side um, as he sees this dagger begin to levitate up into the air. And the kid's just like, whoa, as he watches it slowly move through the air. Whoa, 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 whoa towards you slug the slug just pluck it out of the air is it yeah. matter of fact and then he says never send a kid to do a slug's job <laughs> <laughs> the kid like on all fours just scrambles back over towards you and it's just like I'm sorry slug I tried you did your best that's all we can ask and you hear from inside the blacksmith, one of the older uh, figure of the the mother, pretty much the matriarch of, of this family, stepping out the front. It's just like, you break it up, you kids. And the two kids just go and scamper back, doing it, taking a big loop round because they're, they're smart. They know not to run straight to you, slug. They scamper around the sides um, of the blacksmith and you all begin to head off with a prized, newly forged... Dagger in your hand, Slug. Oh, sick. So, you head off towards the den. Where do you imagine in, in New Quiver Shank? you got the map in front of you. Where do you imagine uh, the den to be? It's near Deb's Rump. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pile of trash and shit in the centre of the settlement. You've managed to, to prop things up to an outside uh, observer. It might not look like much, but to you guys, it is your... <laughs> your den um you crawl inside the the larger surly teen holding back the little filthy drape that you've put across the front of it holds it back for you slug you get to go in first of course as always you crawl inside and the others follow the little six-year-old not needing to crawl as his head clears the 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 low hanging ceiling and the surly one sits down out front um, of the curtain as the, as the bodyguard and you just hear the sound of him repeatedly, rhythmically slapping his, his club against his, his open palm and trying to be as intimidating as possible. And the two preteens just explode with excitement. They're like, oh, that was amazing, Slug! I wish I had mind powers like you do! Takes a lot. Takes a lot of training to get mind powers like this. Oh, will you, will you train me, Slug? Please, please. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe, maybe next next week. Oh, and they kind of look at each other, mouths open, and this little six year old is just gazing up at you in adoration as you sit and begin your plan for the rest of the day. Amazing, God, I love Slug so much already. So we now skip over. Finally, Henry Mush. As you begin your day, you see Chuck pulling himself out of the well, the um, tendrils of his gunker form slipping up over the lip and pulling himself slowly out and over in the smooth practiced motion. You know, the stone of the well is worn down by Chuck's passing um, as a big smile creases his gunker face, his large amoeba like form. Two little tendrils kind of stretch out towards you, uh, Henry Mush, in a in a in a gesture of of affection. And he just says, M -m -m "Mush." He just waves at him with his little mush hand. Yeah, he one of the tendrils <laughs> waves back and Chuck <clears throat> begins his day. His routine, he can, you can see a small crowd beginning to gather already. People queuing up for their daily rations of mushrooms and small plants that 
Chuck is growing in the garden. He starts going about, and you see all the tiny little tendrils breaking off from his uh, his form and nudging plants one way or the other to get the best sunshine, providing little droplets of moisture from the well. And you can see he's he keeps a little reservoir of water within his own form that he can allow out to, to water the plants and then as he's done the plants he moves over to his favorite place i think probably quite a nice place for henry as well old um disused discarded logs have been built up in a pile at the back of the garden and left to rot kept moist um and an abundance of mushrooms grow inside um and with chucks um, loving care this mushroom farm produces enough to help feed the the struggling people of New Quivershank um, but Henry Mush has other concerns as standing apart from the crowd he spies his two acolytes oh, Herbert God. Kume and Pickbum they are waiting there and you see the, the smaller form of Pickbum the little gnome um, waving at you Henry Mush, um, quite frantically and beckoning you over. Yeah, he would, like, get up to his full size and then make his way over and just sort of say, Hello! The Herbert's just like, Morning, boss. But little Pickbum is frantically scratching at one of the, the little mushrooms that's breaking out on the back of his shoulder, picking at it. And he says, uh, uh, "Boss, we um, we wanted to tell you, um, we 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 know how much you 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 love." And he, his little quivering finger points over towards Chuck. How mu how much you love Chuck? And um, well, we saw one of the um, and he like slowly moves his shaking finger around, like the hand of a clock swivels over towards the the back of the fixer's palisade uh, encampment says one of them was um being all shouty and and mean to chuck last night well that's still very nice uh, it w wasn't nice at all was it herbert no it wasn't nice at all boss it was horrible well maybe we should tell someone Pick scratches at another area of his skin that's beginning to, to break out. You could please to see Henry into more of these small um, budding spores of the mushrooms. He says, w w w we thought we, we well, we're telling telling you. No one else uh, is more important or more clever or more uh, right in what they do. Isn't that right, Herbert? And he elbows Herbert and Herbert says you love the boss well I'm not that dead just doing my best like everyone else he's so humble isn't he Herbert he's very humble but um should we can confront them we could confront them he kind of like squares his shoulders a little bit and stands up slightly taller now only coming up to Herbert's thigh rather than his knee. We could... We could... Hurt them! Or set fire to them! Or something. Well, that's, kinda... uh, that's not very nice. You don't want to respond to violence with more violence. Herbert looks disapprovingly down at Pickbum. It's just like, I told you, boss wouldn't like it. Pickbum looks down at the floor as if he's deeply, deeply ashamed. It's just like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, boss. This is why I needed to ask. I didn't know what to do, and I knew you'd know. You always know. It's okay. Maybe we just talk to them and see what's wrong. Oh, t talk to them, and he, like, slaps his forehead with his palm. I, I wouldn't have thought of it, would I, Herbert? Nope, you never think as smart as the boss thinks. Let's go. And Herbert starts walking towards the the open front of the fixer's compound. Does Henry join them? Yeah, he'll go with them. 
So the three interesting figures of Herbert Kume, <laughs> Pick Bum, and Henry Mush begin to make their way around. Still, despite their being known in the village, they still draw regular uh, stares from the people around them. Um, some with an indifference, some with a smile, and others with a frown. But you come around to the front of the Fixer's compound, and standing at the front of the compound, you see, seemingly berating perhaps an underling, you see the form of a large gif. Um, you know this to be Ignis Sutclench, one of the Fixers he likes to brag about regularly, and you see him just angrily shouting down at this um, small figure that's cringing back in front of him. It's just like, I told you to put my weapons in the oil before you went to sleep. Did you do that? And the figure's just like, no, I'm sorry. I I'll do it tonight. And he's just like, well, tonight's not good enough. And he cuffs the guy on the side of the head with his large gif hand, flapping hard enough to echo around the sound. And the guy goes stumbling back, back and you can see blood coming out of his ear where he's been struck so harshly. And he goes running off back into the, the tents in the compound. Ignis turns to see the rest of y the, you guys standing there. Just says, can I help you? Um, yes, um, well, my friend here said he was being mean to Chuck, and that's not very nice. It's like a moment where he just pauses and looks at the three of you, sizing you up. And then he very purposefully leans his, his chest kind of, let chest forward and head back, and just guffaws into the air. Ah! Oh! Nice. Nice doesn't get you anywhere. And if Chuck doesn't know what's good for him, then seems like I'd be helping if I let him know. Let him know what? Your mic's struggling with the Henry Mush voice. <laughs> Fuck, hold on, let me... Let <laughs> yeah, me if you can adjust echo. it. Audio and voice, where is it? Let's try and turn off the... Which character did I have where it just always cut out? Uh, God. It's a high voice. I know Maybe. Beavers did, but um, there was another one Is that more better? recently. Give it a go. Henry Mish. Cutting out a little bit, maybe better? Let's try a different... What if I just yeah, talk like this? Yeah. That's working okay. fine, yeah. Um, so yeah, what, Ignis says, yeah, what he knows he what's good then? for him. He says, well, I was just helping. If Chuck doesn't know what's good for him, then I'm helping by letting him know. Letting him know what? Letting him know that we all work better when we work as a team. And he crosses his muscly arms in front of himself and kind of nods his head back towards the tents behind, you know, the other fixers. I hear... We're just trying to do what's best for New Quivershank, so Chuck doesn't want to be on board with that. It's, well, we've we've got to do what's right for the people. What's right for the people? Well, it's, it's all very well and good. Chuck doing what he does. Holds his hand, breaks the, the crossed arms and holds his hands up as if apologising. So, and he does amazing things, growing all those mushrooms and the plants and that, and the water. God, where would we be without him, eh? But, um, let's face it. <coughs> I've seen Chuck hundreds of times, and I've never seen a brain floating around in there. So, perhaps someone with a bit more, um, taps his head intellect could do a better job of distributing the goods. Chuck, of course, would still be there to grow the stuff and clean the water, but... If it came through us, well, we know the people of the of New Quivershank. We'd be able to make sure it gets to the people who need it most. Chuck's doing his best. Well, look around you. Is his best really good enough? I like it. Well, that's lovely. But I don't, and nor do the rest of us. We think we'd do a better job with it. No, we know we would. So I was just letting Chuck know that, of course, he's always got a job here, but if he could just do the smart thing and let us take care of the business, 
side, then we've got no problems. Well, maybe next time you don't shout at him. He looks at you. I mean, I imagine this gif looking at Henry Mush and it's just this dead old woman <laughs> hanging off the side. It's just yeah. like, what? <laughs> Yeah, he looks nervously at the, <laughs> the dead old woman's side. But he squares up, and he's like, Oh yeah? And what are you going to do about it if I do? He just doesn't say anything. He just stares at him. <laughs> it's actually more intimidating. But the guy is lives in this world of bragging and just says yeah thought so and you see herbert next to you kind of flinch a bit and he's just like don't be mean to the boss and this guy just scoffs ignis as if any of you could do anything well if that's all gentlemen i'll bid you good day and he turns to begin walking back into the fixer's compound he's not very nice Bum say, I told you, you should have set them all on fire. No, that wouldn't be very nice either, but we can always show him a better path. Herbert nods sagely. Better path. Pig Bum say, What's the better path? Well, you know, like. Being nice to people and and sometimes sometimes people just need a new perspective. How, how do we get them to see the new perspective, boss? I'll pop by later and see what I can do. Oh my god, he's so fucking scary. <laughs> <laughs> Pig Bum has a, a wry little grin on his face, just like, yeah. We'll be back later! And he points it into the fixer's compound <laughs> so no one can great. really hear. It's almost like Henry Mush has two angels on his side. <laughs> like, one he's like, Yeah, burn it down! The other one's like, oh, I don't know, you're right. <laughs> Fantastic. So, the four of you go about your days stealing things, threatening people, Trying to find ways to pass the time, entertaining others. But the day begins to draw to a close, and you all know that a celebration is being put on at the poorer Pushkin. I think even Pushkin himself um, would have asked you, Tiberius, with your in your standing as a uh, an entertainer, a performer, to go around and kind of advertise. Oh yeah, he definitely do that. When he would give you a little free bottle or something for doing so. People gather, they come from over the town, though many of you um, attending would notice that not as many people have come as have in previous years, and anybody travelling from the northern side of the town would notice that there seems to be an, a kind of alternative celebration being held in and around the Fixer's compound. They've put out drinks and some fires and what have you, and are encouraging people to, to go there instead. But, would you gather in the poor of Pushkin? Yes, I really would. Yeah. Yeah, Lorco, Henry? Yeah. <clears throat> he put by. And, and Slug. I uh, imagine maybe his mum would bring him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get him in his Sunday best. <laughs> <laughs> Try and tame his hair with a comb. Oh, God. Won't do anything. So you all head inside the poor of Pushkin, and people celebrate um, 60 years since the initial founding of New Quivershank after the voyage of the Quiver Sail. The Lord Ernst Quivershank, quite old now, gives a speech talking about how happy he is seeing all the wonderful people that have lived here and this amazing settlement. And he goes on and on in grandiose terms. 
and eventually begins to start listing off some of the things he likes about different people um, before Pushkin kindly kind of gently shifts him off of the stage, which is just the top of a, a drinking table. Um, but the night begins and, and people celebrate. There's little games, gambling, people chat with each other. I imagine Tiberius himself would want to perform. Yeah, of course. He'd also give a rousing um, demonstration of what happened at the Tower of a Child, but obviously massively <laughs> overdone. Incredible. And people love it. There is a lot of anti-Sari uh, sentiment in the village. People laugh and enjoy it. But as the, the night wears on and <laughs> slug, you're beginning to wonder when your mum's going to take you back for bedtime. Um, there's an immediate hush as one of the doors to the poor Pushkin is slammed open and silhouetted in the doorway is a large gif form Ignis Sutklench one of the fixers stands at a moment hand against the door everyone's turns to look at him the music stopped and he says, everybody out, I need to have a word with the proprietor of the establishment. And he makes immediate eye contact with Pushkin behind the bar. Did Pushkin say something? Please. Oh, my dear man, we're celebrating. We can go in the back. I don't think everyone heard me. Get out! And he shouts really loud. And you see immediately some people begin to file out. Some worried about their children. Others not willing to 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 stand up to this large gift form. <laughs> everyone begins to file out. Lorcor doesn't. Lorcor stays? Lorcor stays. And he looks. And he looks at his drink. And he's just like, oh, I haven't finished my drink. Ignis stomps over towards Lorcor and slaps your drink off the table onto the ground. Well, now you're finished, so why don't you fuck off? Well, now you owe me a new one. So why don't you pay for it? And he punches him in the face. Yeah! Okay. Right, we're going to roll initiative. <laughs> Oh, Slug, your mum would be tugging on you to get you to leave. Would you react? Would you resist? Uh, yeah, I want to see what happens. Yeah, fantastic. Right, let's move us over here. Get some battling music on. This. Yeah. Oh, wait. No. Uh, if you can drag yourselves out anywhere kind of on the left side of the map's fine. This is only a placeholder for the poor Pushkin. I almost finished, buddy. Done in time. Uh, let's get Ignis out. Could Pushkin be like, Push, everyone calm down! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you can just see it has effect. It helps some of the people. But um, Ignis is having none of it as he squares up to Lorcor. And they would be right next to each other, I think. Oosh. <laughs> you can't get in. Can't get in, Tom. The, door, the doors should be open. I opened it for him. How do you get in? Over here. Can you go to the side? Uh, I might have fucked up the doors. I'll just drag you in. I can do it. Yeah. I, I got in. I don't, I don't know whether to make <laughs> Slug a token or not. I kind of love that he's a square. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <clears throat> right, let's fix what we can, though. Willy, Slug, <laughs> Nelly. Nameplate. Hit points. Um. 
This square is great. <laughs> yeah, I'm key hundred percent keeping it as the square. Vision. Make sure you've got your HP. Oop, sixteen. Fantastic. So um we'll get that punch done first. That was that was fairly done. Yeah. Go ahead and roll. Unarmed attack. So we've got a problem with Sari, but then there's also internal strife. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't know what you mean, they're just trying to do what's best for new quiver shank. Oh, 16 does not hit, I'm afraid. Oh, so... The punch comes swinging in, and you land, but it kind of glances off as he's quicker than he looks. And it hits the side of his face, mm -hmm. but only a glancing blow. Right. As that happens, he calls outside and just says, Lads, get in here! <laughs> so, if you would like to roll initiative, please. Where's my battle music? There it is. Shit. Too busy looking at what I was going to do. Um... What is initiative? So, it's like, it's like on the on character, George. It's on the bottom right under perception. Oddly, quite hidden. Uh, it's quite hidden. Yeah. Not best design in the world. Right. Let's remember to do the thing that Natalie and Kieran taught me. Disconnect from hit points. The same. Perfect. And then initiative. Oh, now both go on that turn. Do we have everybody? Looks like and I, it. I did. Yeah. I did get old Pushkin's token out. <laughs> He won't be an active combat participant, I'm afraid, Kieran, because he's old and gouty. But um, and also, and he has one eye. <laughs> he, oh yes, absolutely. The um, old cyclopean gouty proprietor, much loved in the village, um, proprietor of the poor Pushkin. But we begin quick off the mark. Two players, Tiberius, you're up. Yeah, it's lucky Pushkin, isn't it? Because he'd be using his cook feet to get some hippo for dinner. Um, <laughs> uh, Tiberius is going to... You fixers don't fix anything! <laughs> I mean, he's going to cast... Um, <laughs> days. Which is oh, terrifying. yeah. I love this kind of trip. O on the guy. On Ignis. Very cool. I will yeah, roll. Save. I will save. <laughs> will. Oh. oh, he rolls very well, I'm afraid. <clears throat> 22. When he said that, he sounded like the potion seller so guy. He's like, you have no respect for knights. <laughs> Does it do anything? I'm trying to work out if it's going to move. Oh, basic saving throw. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to work out who's going to move. Do you see this guy coming in? Absolutely. The door's still open. And as soon as he called out, you saw these two guys who were essentially flanking the door like guards begin to move. In. Yeah, no. so, yeah. He's going to run over here, jump on the desk, the guard push him. He's like, but the fixers kill Pushkin! <laughs> the fixers what? I'm trying to kill Pushkin. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Lawcore. Norcore, please him dodge, kind of does a bit of a grin, like, mm, okay, now I can be, go a bit harder. Mm. Um, was it an action to rage or not? 
I think so. Let me check. This is what we're doing in session one. Oh god. Everyone's playing Pathfinder now and Archives of Nephis died. PF2. Let's see. Rage. It is one action. So one action to rage. Yeah. Uh, which I think is minus one AC. Mm -hmm. uh, And don't forget your temporary it's HP. Fine. What is the temporary HP? Mm. Equal to your level plus your con mod. Okay. So, three? No. Four. I'll put a little timer on. Oh. And then I will. Him. Aim for the shoulders. Very cool. 21 absolutely hits. Holy shit. 12 piercing damage. Yeah, and then plus 2 for rage. I think oh, yeah. Two. Uh, 14. Fuck. Yeah, your, it, your fangs sink in so far that you, you feel like you could rip out a chunk of his shoulder if you wanted to. Jesus. Well, he won't do that. He won't do that, but, but he will tail whip him. Nice. Tail comes swinging round. Ooh. Is that with the minus five? What? For it being <laughs> multiple attack second penalty? Attack. Oh, um, I think I did. Add... Oh, no, I didn't press the second one. No, no. Yeah, minus I mean, it five. still hits. 19. Yeah. Four, five, um, plus two is seven. Oh my and then God, that's got kind of... the sweep and the trip as well. I think just trip applies. So trip, I looked this up. Mm -hmm. Um, you you need to spend another action to do the trip. Oh okay. Yep. Which sounds like when I first saw that, I was like, well, well that's useless. But what I yeah. realised is, it, usually with trip you need a free hand. Um, oh, okay. But with your tail, you can do it like that. If that makes sense. Uh. But do I need another action? Because I don't have one. Yeah, so if, if you wanted to trip him up, you would have needed another action to do okay. it. You still do the damage and everything, you hit him, but the trip trait means you can trip with the weapon, or in your case, your tail. Can I swap it and just do trip and not the damage? Yeah, absolutely. I want to trip him over. Yeah. Uh, so this is your athletics against his reflex DC. So roll an athletics for okay. me, please. That guy just came to speak to Pushkin. Now he's like oh. half dead on the floor. <laughs> yeah, he's getting fucked up. Uh, hero point, I think, on that one. Yep. Spend that hero point, dear. Oh. Uh, reflex. Ooh, this guy actually has a pretty good reflex save. I'm afraid you fail. Yeah. Just stay on his feet. Yeah. It's quicker than he looks. But still, a very nasty turn. Right. The ruffians. They see their boss in trouble. So they're definitely going to come in and deal with that. So, first action to stride. Second action. So. Oh, actually, yeah, this one. Sorry. This one from the door is actually going to use their opening threat ability. Mm -hmm. So they're going to use an interact action to draw a dagger. And then they also, in the same action, get to demoralize. They're going to try and demoralize you, Lorco. Oh, try it. Oh. It's actually pretty shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, so they make their intimidate check. I <laughs> rolled an 8. I assume that fails. Uh, what, what do I roll again? Uh, it's against your will um, uh, save DC. So whatever yep. it says for your will save, plus 10. Oh, uh, so 16. 16. So yeah, they definitely fail. So the guy pulls out his dagger and is like, You're going down, big man! But he's shouting that at someone who, who has their teeth sunk into the shoulder 
of their boss. Um, and it falls on deaf ears as you're raging out. Second action to move. Go to this side of you. Third action is going to try and stab you with a dagger. Stab! <laughs> 16. Uh, it hits me, I think. Yeah. No, wait. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it the rage. Now, yeah. Uh, five piercing damage. Okay. And then third action. Oh, no. Opening uh, threat, move, stab. The other ruffian is going to threaten you, Tiberius. Just like, going to make you eat that loot. <laughs> he rolls a six. <laughs> <laughs> What's your uh, will save? Um... God. So whatever your will save is, you add ten to it. Wait, where does it say it? Uh, it's where your oh, save starts. Oh, five, so fifteen. Fifteen, yeah. So he completely fails. Doesn't critical fail, but I imagine Tiberius just shrugs it off or chortles at him. He'd be um, like, "You better look at his boss. Your boss. He's pretty bloodied." Fuck. He is gonna do that. Five, ten. They're gonna try and flank. So, uh, Lorcor, you are flat-footed only to these two as they're flanking you. So you have a further minus two to your AC. He's going to try and stab you at this final action. Stab! Yep. It does hit. Four piercing. And that is their turns. Henry Mush. This is awfully violent. Um... <laughs> What am I gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> it's all getting a bit. Bit stabby. Uh, he wasn't wanting it to go this way, but he, he's got to try and calm him down a bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. so he's gonna walk up to here and he's gonna be like, D Don't worry, I'll, 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 I'll calm him down. And he's gonna cast his seed pod. Whoa! At him. What this? It's a ranged attack. Very cool. Fifteen. Fifteen misses, I'm afraid. Oh. Um, we moved. I'll yeah, just do it again. <laughs> Very <laughs> cool. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so two seed pods go flinging out, I imagine, of Henry Mush's body. Boop, yeah. boop. They go flying off and splatter against the walls of the, the poor Pushkin. All right, Ignis... It's not very happy. He will... <laughs> With his huge um, maul, or it's called a thunder mace, he's going to try and slam it into you, Lorcor. <laughs> like, how dare you bite me! <laughs> Fuck! 12 to hit. It misses. He is going to... Oh, I should have done that first. But that's fine. Yeah. yeah, he's going to try and trip you himself. Yeah. Athletics against your reflex DC. Oh my god. A natural one. <laughs> it definitely fails. Oh god. What's your reflex DC? Uh... What is it again? I don't oh, know. actually, it's so it would be it's your reflex save, but with ten added to it. Uh, okay, so it's four, 14? Yeah, so he got eight, which is a failure less than fourteen, but because he got the nat one, it lowers it to a critical failure. So, <laughs> on a critical failure, when you try and trip someone, Ignis reaches out and grabs you. The blood's running down his arm though, and he kind of slips and stumbles. He's like. I'm gonna throw you to the floor, 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 and goes tumbling down onto the floor himself. He is now prone. Fuck it, it's right where I want you. What a fucking idiot. <laughs> um, that was his second action, so he could use. He will shamefully use his final action to stand <laughs> back up again, <laughs> dust himself off, and. <clears throat> Willy slug nilly. So George, <laughs> this is your first turn of of Pathfinder combat. Yeah. It does take some getting used to, but it's not all too dissimilar um, 
from 5e. Instead of having movement, action, bonus action, you just get three actions. And if you want to move, you use one of those actions to take what's called the stride action, which is where you move your movement speed or as much of your movement speed as you like. Spells typically are two actions. So as a spellcaster, it's actually quite often in a turn you might like move and then cast a spell or there's lots of different things you can do. Uh, you can try and demoralize the enemy. Um, there's a, an action called recall knowledge where you try and remember like weaknesses or details about your enemies. Though with the It has reach, right? Yeah, 15 feet of reach. Oh, <laughs> it's the like, whip cracks out. You've, you fixers are no better than the sorry. <laughs> A nine does miss, I'm afraid. Oh, he got in his repertoire. Um, and then he will use telekinetic projectile. Oh, very cool. What does he so fling? This. He's going to do a coal from the fire. Ooh, that's cool. I would definitely give you some fire damage in there as well. But unfortunately, some bad rolls. This one goes flinging past, lands on the wooden floor. I imagine Pushkin might have something to say about that. <laughs> Please, everyone, just calm down and Tiberius, pick up that call. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Loco. <laughs> um. Surrounded uh, by prey. Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> I wondered what hippo tasted like for a long time. <laughs> Jawing again. Oh, how that definitely hits. So, my question is Is Lorcor trying to kill or just knock him out? Completely up to you. You are raging, but you can do yeah. things non lethally. How, how do we feel about killing uh, things in the in the um, sorry, the empire? There is no there is no law or such here. Um, there was kind of a semblance of it if you remember from Shores of Potential. Toria Mooncloud was kind of like the guard captain, and in stated law, but she kind of gave up eventually oh, and retired. I have a good question: What does Lorco think of Ignis? Mm. It's right. Well, <laughs> and to you, Tom, as well, because how would this guy in ping on local's life? Oh yeah, this guy's an arsehole. He's a well-known arsehole. He's still in my hunts every morning. Yep. Mm. Would mother approve? Oh yeah. Oh, then he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> the teeth go in and tear out the throat. Yeah. And oh, blood, goodness. <laughs> blood bubbling and splattering across the floor and walls of the poor Pushkin. Ignis falls to the ground. And then Lorcor just raises his head with bloody fans. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> and he just looks at this guy and he's going to do. Um, 
yeah. Demoralizing glare. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so he just yep. glares at him and it does the demoralized thing, I think. Yep, go Which ahead and roll. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yep. going to go for the last bite on that guy. I think. Does Have you rolled your, second or a third? you rolled your intimidate? Oh, yeah, hang on. Uh, where's my button? Intimidation check, please. Uh, I'm giving you a plus, god, a plus four circumstance bonus to this. Cool. Uh, because you just ripped out his mate's throat. Boss's throat. Yep. So that becomes 13. Let's have a look at his will save. So rough here. Hey, you succeed. Yeah. Will save was twelve, or will DC is twelve, so he is frightened. And um, it, the two, the second hit and the third hit only really counts when it's when you've done like three attacks in a row. So this would be the second. Uh, yeah. If you go for another attack, it would be the second. Yes, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Um... You are correct. Yep. Very good. Yep. Definitely hits. One. I was taking the... So I pressed the two. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can just roll a thing and see what damage comes up. Okay. 11. <laughs> Which guy? The one uh, to north or south? Uh, the, the frightened one. Oh, my God. So, the rest of you see Law Calls Jaws tear out the throat the big form of ignis soot clencher who just goes bubbling and burbling dead to the ground and then he turns around and i just imagine it like fucking jaws just clamp around this guy's head and he his head is torn from his body and he is dead turns around <laughs> absolutely fucking terrifying um, yeah, this guy is running the fuck away. <laughs> uh, five, ten. It's just like, you're insane! Don't kill me! Fifteen, twenty. And yeah, he just runs off the map. Is anybody pursuing him? No. <laughs> is anybody apart from Lorcor pursuing him? Hi, Barrett, this isn't. No. Okay. I want to do something else. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. Henry Mush. Henry Mush is going to rush up to the body of Ignis and say, Don't worry, I'll save him! And he's going to, like, just open his mouth and shoot loads of seed pods into it. <laughs> <laughs> the seed pods go flying into the body. You see them gathering um, satisfyingly in the nutrient-rich blood. Henry, you know the seed pods are likely to take in this kind of rich environment. That's it. <laughs> Very nice. You vomit seed pods into the dead guy's <laughs> throat. <laughs> yeah! Is there anything from anyone else? All enemies are disappearing. We will continue with Lorcor. <laughs> oh, he would but... move to this guy after to do it in his next turn. The same thing. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Anybody else? Would Tiberius or Slug want to do anything? Tiberius would just look at Pushkin. He's like, What are we going to do? It's a dead guy! <laughs> How would Pushkin respond? What's his relationship with this guy? Ignis? Yeah. Um, he probably thinks Ignis is an arsehole. Is, so he the, 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 is, is he the big boss? He's not the big boss of the Fixers, no. He's an up-and-coming lieutenant who is no longer up-and-coming. Uh, Pushkin would like, we just got to stay calm, stay calm. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Pushkin is equally like, oh fuck. <laughs> yep, there's definitely potentially consequences here. So, uh, anything from Slug, or is Slug just hiding under and gazing out at the horrific massacre that has occurred in front of him? Yeah, just keeping an eye on what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, Lorcor, you want to chase down this, this ruffian yeah. out into the street? Yep. You're in your bestial rage. Um, what is your speed? Is it 25? 
It is 25, yep. So, do you have any ranged weapons? Because what will end up happening is you'll just end up chasing each other at the same speed. Well, might do, but I do also have this thing called Sudden Charge, where you do, if you do two dashes, you get a free swing. So you would stride and then Sudden Mm -hmm. Charge. Is Sudden Charge two actions? So, Sudden Charge is two actions, so it's basically a dash. Oh my god, that's fucking awesome. Uh, yeah, go ahead and make your attack against this guy. As the huge, muscular form. God, I can picture it in my head so clearly. These bloody scales just go skidding and sliding out into the street. This guy's just in full sprint mode. Oh god, someone help me! As Lorcor is chasing him down. <laughs> And I jump on him. Ah. Oh, well, you might think it misses, but it doesn't. This guy has an AC of 13. And to be honest, <laughs> I would have lowered it with how fucking scared he is. But 13 hits anyway. Jesus, 15 damage? I keep checking the numbers, but the numbers don't lie. And they spell disaster for you. <laughs> Um, and it was like, oh, I didn't really do anything in the last one this time. <laughs> Norco's just there, minutes. like, space of like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you finish off this last ruffian? He's like uh, sprinting think... away, but Lorcor just comes up from behind. Yeah, with a with a toothy, bloody grin, he's chasing him, and he just leaps, both claws in the back, and he pushes him down to the ground and bites his head. Somebody help me block! Crunch. Incredible. People out in the street kind of gasp and look on. Some people shield their children's faces from this bloody sight. But others cheer. There's some slight cheering. Some people really don't like the fixes. But you also would see Lorcor, some people breaking off from the crowd and running off towards the fixer's compound. Yeah. He is Me. very dead. Oosh. Well. That was fucking insane. With that, we drop out of combat. And seeing as I don't think I'm ever going to get to use this otherwise, and I put the sound clip up, I'm going to use it as your guys' victory theme instead. Okay, then not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just love that too much. No, right. We need to do that every time now. Wow, you better fucking believe I'll be doing that every time. <laughs> okay. All right. That's the sound, the sound of those seeds going down the throat. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, speaking of which, Pickbum and Herbert Kume would definitely run in and be like, Are you right, boss? Quickly, we gotta get their bodies to chuck. I'm sorry, Natalie, oh. you're still cutting out a bit. I'm going to have to change his voice, and I? Quickly, let's get these bodies to Chuck. Oh, yeah, Herbert Kume would bend down, lift one up with ease. Uh, probably even Ignis. He's a big, strong guy, Herbert. And um, Pickbum would just start, like, pulling on this uh, the ruffian's arm and dragging them away. Would anybody intervene or stop? Yeah, L- Lorca's coming back. He's dragging the body by a foot back into the room. Very nice. And he just chucks the one of the bodies in there. He's like, Ugh. "Well, whatever they got on them, we'll pay for another drink, right?" And he looks at Pushkin. <laughs> They're Tiberius. We like, oh, local. That was a bit of a kerfuffle. I'll buy your drink this time. <clears throat> oh, thanks. This is really no problem. Oh, free one. I think we should see Bodin in the sky as well. Sorry, it's like, actually, uh, this big boy, and he would uh, put his hand on Loco, kind of nervously. He's like, I think he needs three drinks, Pushkin. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd give him money for that. Yeah, Pushkin would definitely assent, I think. Nobody wants to get on the bad side of Loco right now. I think Pushkin, his fur would have just gone even more grey as this happened. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um. The, yeah, the drinks come forth, Lorcor. Does that satisfy yeah. you? It is satisfied. Amazing. Fucking love Lorcor. 
Very cool. Um, then the the acolytes, the acolytes of Mush, will continue to drag um, the bodies unless anyone stops them. Nope. No. Very cool. They head out, drag the bodies over towards Chuck's. Um, you do know that Chuck's garden and well is right next to the fixer's compound. Would that change what you want to do at all? Let's uh, maybe take a more less direct route. Okay, so over to the side <laughs> and then <laughs> can to we, the can, north. Can we? Can does Henry know anything about like a like a way, a secret way through the um, like outside or something like outside the wall that they could go round and then like because it's 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 gardens like right next to the palisade, isn't it? It is, and due to the nature of Chuck's garden, it has rotted away bits of the palisade itself. Um, so you definitely know that there are some holes in the palisade, and were you to go outside, there would be direct access from outside to Chuck's garden. Yeah, let's do that. Fantastic, I love that. Go ahead and make... Make a stealth check for me, please. <laughs> okay. No, there's there's a very low DC I'm setting in my mind. Okay. <laughs> <Crystal Black laughs> in which you just made the very easy, simple DC in Pathfinder is 5. So yeah, there's a bit of bumps at one point. Herbert knocks his head so, ooh, on one of the holes in the palisade. But you, there's excited murmurings about the village um, and people kind of keeping to themselves as you bring it over. Um, back in the, the poor Pushkin, um, <laughs> Slug, from your position beneath the table, your mother still hasn't left. She's not going to leave without you. Do you go with her now? I don't know, I don't really want to leave all the drama, but then she's kind of cramping my style. I think, <laughs> would Tiberius see Slug under the table? Oh, without a doubt. Slug has cover, but it's very easy to see under there. He'd, he'd kind of look at Pushkin and look at Slug, and he'd be like... It's... What are you doing under there, little sprog? You're pretty brave to stay and watch the little calamity that happened. Uh, Slug doesn't know what to say to this guy. <laughs> he's going to be like, he's going to look over at his, his mum and be like, maybe the little um, Sprog should have a drink, calm his nerves, eh, mummy? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, Slug gets out from under the table. He's <laughs> It's into that idea. Mother, mother slug, puts her hands on her hips as fists, but it can't take her eyes off the back of Lorcor, who just has all this blood all over him. <laughs> and it's just like, um, does that mean he'd be on? You, you guys could look after him. Of course, he can. Uh... You can come and have a drink with the big boys at the bar. And you look I look after like your... <laughs> Well, yes, exactly, mother. <laughs> now, Willie, you know you can't look after yourself. You're only a child. Nah. <laughs> She'd look Tiberius over to Tiberius and just say, please, uh, I'll... We don't live too far away. Just, <laughs> just keep him safe, please. Ah, uh, uh, she looks down at Slug. I'll be back in half an hour. All right. Gotta go. Make sure your father's okay. She heads we'll, off. We'll try not to have him drink us under the table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excellent parenting from Mother Slug there. And he'd, he'd, he'd also um, get Pushkin to get uh, Slug a drink. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I only drink above the table. <laughs> well, you can drink above the table, I can drink on the table, and Slug, Slug or he can drink next to me on the table. I mean... <laughs> Killing two men in cold blood, that's pretty, um, they're fixes, so men is, you know, a bit of a big word, um, well, yes. 
Well, we can't... one of them was a hippo. <laughs> true, true. And you tore his throat right out. How is that going down? Delicious, honestly. He looks over at Pushkin and it's like, this won't cause any problems for you, will it, Pushkin? <laughs> Pushkin would um, <laughs> look very concerned, twiddle his uh, whiskers, and he'd look deep in thought, and um, yes, he'd think that there are potentially a lot of problems about to come his way, um, and that you guys might want to either stick together for safety or make yourself scarce. And he's got some ideas about that, but he wants... He wants Henry Mush back here first. So we'll cut quickly to Henry Mush. As you bring the bodies, along with Herbert and Pickbum, to uh, Chuck's garden, Henry, Chuck's there, as he always is, um, sees the bodies, and there's no, like, re Chuck isn't one to um, sudden displays of emotion, but there is a bit of sadness as he looks up at you, and he just says, Death. Very sad. There's a slow nod to his form. The little tendrils reach out and kind of gently touch the faces of each of the bodies. But we can help. He looks back to you. The kind of quizzical look. <laughs> I can't play this fucking card. Um, if the like the garden, sometimes something dies, but something can regrow in its place. Sometimes a yucky weed becomes a beautiful flower. Grooms. And the tendrils kind of point to the three bodies. Exactly. Maybe we should put them in the well, though, so no one finds them. Duck shakes his head. Water. Oh. Clean. And then he, the tendrils reach out. And though he doesn't use them often himself, some people like to help out Chuck because they know how much he does. For the village, there are there's a collection of tools by the side, and one of his um, tendrils splits into two. Each one wraps around the the shaft of a shovel, and it goes over towards um, Herbert and Pickbum, and just drops the shovels into their hands. Points back at the bodies, just says, "Oop." You heard him. You heard him, boys. <laughs> Herbert looks very pleased. This is his his speciality, and takes to the work with great vigor. Pigbum not quite so much, and needs some help from Chuck and perhaps yourself to dig further into the ground. Um, while that's going on, yeah, P Pushkin would want Tiberius to go and get Henry Mush. All right, my fairy friend. I'll. Uh... Check on uh, invalids and uh, our um, thinks of Henry Mush, whatever he is. <laughs> As you head out, Tiberius, you can see that there are some people that you know to be fixers starting to to look around um, the village and sort of gather and knock on doors and start gathering people into a little uh, gang. Hmm. He wouldn't directly interact with him. He'd just kind of rush towards yep. Henry Mush. Yeah, you rush towards Chuck's garden and you you see them there um, burying the bodies. They're nearly done at this point. Herbert does a very quick job of digging up the, the soft, um, loamy soil. Um, and the bodies are being lowered in. Um, but yeah, you see Henry Mush there. But he'd be like, oh, Henry! <laughs> oh, hello! What What are you... Look down. What are you doing? 
We're regrowing the bodies in the garden. Oh. Right. Uh, <laughs> he lit with his Chuck there as well. Chuck's there. Chuck's helping. He raised his knife out. Uh, Chuck, is this uh, normal? Chuck, um, the bottom kind of half rough or two thirds of him continues to use his flattened tendrils to scoop large amounts of earth out of the ground but the top part of it kind of slowly turns to you stretching around um, Tiberius and he looks at you and just says shrooms right, uh, in the future I don't particularly want to know where my food comes from so I'll just let you uh, get on with this uh, Henry <laughs> Uh, Pushkin has, uh, he, 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 he kind of looks at the form of, um, the woman growing, or woman dying on the side of Henry Mesh. It's sort of like, Pushkin's, uh, he wants you back at the, uh, poor Pushkin, um, I think after the ordeal we need to, a debrief, as it were. Okay. Well, um... I'll leave you two here then. Referring to Pick Bum and Herbert. Yep. I like to imagine they have a particular kind of hand signal or sign they make. They do a little nod and a reverent signal to Henry Mush. On the way back to Henry Mush, he would look at Henry Mush and be like, So, Henry, um. I've never wanted to ask you this before, but uh, what exactly are you? <laughs> I'm Henry. I know, but um, <laughs> what is... He points at a woman. <laughs> um, I don't know her name. I... What... Does she talk? No, she's, um... She's the... Hmm. She's kind of like my mum. Ah, uh, mothers. Always getting in the way. <laughs> I can imagine when they're gloomed onto you as she is, it must be even more annoying than my deaf old mama. She's quite quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for the best, Henry, I, I suppose. Um, well, uh, it's quite... What, what's happened tonight and um well seeing as we're bonded by folly and he'd hold out his hand <laughs> like okay i don't know to touch henry <laughs> I, um, <laughs> henry would put out his hand well, um, i guess we are budding friends yes <laughs> oh that's lovely <laughs> I don't know if budding's the right word, considering um, the mushroom aspect of you, but um, he would like go to pat Henry Mush's head. He would lean in and let him pat his head. What would it, what would it feel like? <laughs> probably like, probably just like literally like the softness of a mushroom, but maybe sort of like some more thick. You're like, you're like, interesting. Um, well, we've got um, our lizardy folk friend uh, who brutalised those people. And there's a lo young sprog in there as well who um, I've got up to the bar. Just let's see what has Pushkin has to say. That's a good idea. I'm sad they're dead, but they, they weren't very nice people to chuck. Oh, no, they weren't very nice. Those fixers are the same as the sorry. We should, our internal divisions should be smoked down so we can tackle the sorry together, yes? Mm. I'm so glad you agree. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. As you come back to the poor Pushkin, you can see um, Pushkin has either asked someone to or himself has moved around, perhaps some of his kids locked up the doors but you are ushered inside and the door final door is locked behind you um with all of you there pushkin kind of gathers you in um and 
thanks you for um, <laughs> defending kind of the honor of his place, even if it was perhaps in quite a nervously glancing at Lork or violent manner. Um, he he says about the, the troubles that New Quivershank is facing. Um, more and more we see problems within as well as the great problems without people struggle to get by with the food uh, that's here and the drink um the sari won't allow things that people need uh, you know both practically in terms of food and expansion more space but also spiritually or psychologically people need a, a sense of moving forward and that's exactly what the sari won't allow them to have um particularly with the events that have just occurred the four of you pushkin says are likely to be targeted by the fixers and despite law great prowess um the fixers have a lot of resources and you've only taken out a few of their lower level members um pushkin thinks that he's likely to be fine the fixers won't openly oppose him he's much too well loved in the village and the fixers want to play a, a slow game of manipulation and slowly growing but pushkin thinks that he'd already had a thought um and this plays quite well to one get you guys out of a, a hot area for a while um Though he glances sympathetically at Slug, who didn't actually attack anyone, <laughs> but is <laughs> guilty by association, most likely in the Fixer's eyes. Tiberius um, would put his hand on Slug's back and be like, he's one of the big boys now. <laughs> <laughs> would Slug have any response to this? Um, he would just look a bit kind of bewildered and I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'd look down at Slug and be like, don't worry, Slug. We'll tell them you're involved as well. We don't want to tarnish your reputation with the, your little gang. I know that you hate that child in the tower as well. So we have, we have something in common. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you that I embarrassed him today? It's quite the sight. <laughs> Slug. <laughs> Slug's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, mate, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not really listening. Um, Pushkin lingers a, a little on Slug, unsure, perhaps, but says that he thinks it, it. this will serve two purposes. One, to get you guys out of here for a little while while things cool down. But two, he's been mulling an idea in his mind for a while if he were a younger cat folk he would do it himself but where he thinks new quivershank is desperately in need of some heroes right now people with certain skills as he passes an eye over everyone sat here <laughs> some more obvious than others i various to be like yes yeah, slug has all the skills i've seen his mind powers manifest <laughs> Um, but, um, he hopes that people, um, skilled folk can head out from New Quiver Shank, though it would need to be done, um, stealthily to not alert the Sari, and perhaps find something, anything to help them, uh, in the situation, whether that is a new place to settle, some kind of new ally or power that might help them overthrow the Sari from oppressing them or strike a new deal with the Sari. Um, perhaps even find what happened to Salia, um, one of the original founders of New Quivershank, who took a good few of the citizens and went off to found uh, her own, presumably her own place, though no one here really knows um, now. She has not been seen um, for the vast majority of years that New Quivershank has stood um, but as you talk to Pushkin you see there's a real look of, of sadness and a bit of desperation but also a glimmer of hope in his eyes um, he rec recalls the tale to you of how he and the Lord when they were younger head out and managed to 
shift the great stampede of tumblers um, to the very beginnings of New Quivershank. Tumblers being a, a livestock style or wild livestock style creature here that provide lots of food. When the people were in need of food, they managed to do that. These great deeds that can change people's lives. Um, and as he kind of brings his, his speech to a close, he's looking for a reaction on, on each of your faces. Um, how do people react to this proposal, this grand proposal? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to help. Well, Lord Cord doesn't like the sorry. He kind of want to fuck them over. Mm -hmm. But he also doesn't want to leave his mum. Yeah. But also... He really wants to explore and kill stuff, so I think he's going to agree. He'd also know that Krez went with Salia. Yeah, had the name Salia. He's like, oh, there's my opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Tiberius? Um, Tiberius, for that. Anything to live up to my daddy's name. He's, and we obviously can't reach the full uh, glory of coming. To this beautiful isle, but I will do what I can. Slug. <laughs> Slug's just thinking maybe he can get some treasure for the den. Oh yeah! Oh god! Now I can't kill Slug. He's too cool. Um. And Henry. But I'd love to help. Yeah. They're just as bad as them fixers being mean to Chuck. That sounds no good. I like how that problem took care of itself. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. Um, Pushkin seems pleased um, with this and hands out a, a free drink to everyone, though nothing alcoholic to slug now. Or perhaps, what? perhaps something what? very weak, weak. weakened <laughs> wine. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just um, like some water, please. Oh, yeah. Pushkin would give you a big bowl of, of water or whatever vessel you prefer to have it in. He just sticks his hand in it. Yeah. Um, and Pushkin would, with um, you having agreed, he would say that he thinks um, that time is of the essence. That you should gather your things and, and head out um, this very night. He thinks he has potentially a bit of... Um, well, it's it's thin, but a bit of a lead for you. He says you've got kind of two options uh, to begin with. Um, to the west, directly and quite close by through the jungle, um, there are there is a ruined tower occupied by the exiled Sari who occasionally try to raid or harass you here in New Quivershank. Um, Pushkin thinks there must be some reason why they stick around that tower. It's surrounded by these large pools of still water. Um, and perhaps there there's some clue uh, to what gives them reason to stay, if there's a source of power or something similar. Um, he tells you that you should be careful though. Though the exiled Sari are few in number, they are capable fighters. Um, and attacking things head on <laughs> some might call a breach 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 method would probably not be uh, particularly wise um, alternatively he says there is a stretch of coastline to the northwest um, where the Sari keep um, some of their boats now usually the Sari keep their boats very tightly protected um, they actually often use the hulls of the boats uh, they carry them inland and use them as part of their dwellings. Um, but here, uh, they have essentially what are practice boats that the kids, the Sari children, use to to learn the ropes. They're still full size. The Sari don't believe in having like child size things or what have you. You learn on the big boat because that's what you'll be using when you're older. Um, but they're not um, particularly well protected. They're kept there as like training boats. Um, and he says... Um, that if you're feeling particularly adventurous, you might want to try and use um, one of those boats to travel to one of the nearby islands. No one from New Quivershank, to his knowledge, um, has ever gone to the other islands, and there could be 
great allies there or wealth or power or anything and you this is a continued theme and as pushkin talks there's that you guys he thinks the people of new quivershank need something right now because currently it's either stagnating or actively decaying down to nothing yeah so yeah <laughs> He, he encourages you to, to gather your things, say your goodbyes. If you mm -hmm. don't have um, a bedroll um, of your own, he'll provide you uh, with a bedroll and some some supplies, though with such little food around in your quiver shank, he can only supply you with three days of rations each, but he kind of makes a quip about Lorcor's clear hunting ability and thinks you'll probably be fine without the sari limiting your hunting. Um, but yeah, encourages you to have a, a good think about where you'd like to, to go, where you'd like to try. Mm. Go to the tower. I'm going to go say bye to Mar. I better go say goodbye to Chuck. Yes, Willie, and you better go say goodbye to your mother. <laughs> I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> okay. You will head off to your respective homes to say your goodbyes. We'll go to Lorcor first. You head back and find Thutkane. She was at the celebrations um, earlier, but ducked out quite early. She often tires herself out in the day, especially. She's getting a bit older now. And you find her just seeing to her equipment as she likes to do to calm her before bed yeah i think he i think he'll be quite like uh i think he thinks that she'll be quite understanding about it so he's just gonna walk in hi ma I had to beat up some uh, and maybe kill my enemy you know the one i mean my rival in the mornings well uh, turns out I should probably go and uh, we're going to go on a journey and kill the starry maybe and maybe beat up my mum so uh, <laughs> maybe I'll see you uh, again at some point <laughs> a less tough person would perhaps have dropped what they were doing but your your mother your adopted mother is, is not such a, a person and instead just fixes you with a proud smile just says well you've you've done the the people of new quivershank a service Lorcor. i'm proud of you and i can see from the sight of you that they take a, a serious um savage and swift um beating and she kind of like comes over in a motherly way like holds your chin your huge <laughs> chin she has to hold it in two hands and like says open up yeah, he opens up. Yeah, and she wow. kind of checks your teeth. She's like, yeah, holding up well. You know what I said about biting metal? you got to be careful. Oh, no. They weren't all that. They weren't all that. They were easy. Yeah, go for the soft bits. And she gives you a, a yeah. playful little rib in there. Elbow in the rib. She says, Rock right. has got to work in there as well. Exactly. <laughs> well, very nice. Um... God, I, I, I wish I'd, I'd known sooner. I would have prepared something. Um, can I get you anything? Do you need anything? No, no. That oh, we're gonna. I'm gonna go now. Uh, I'll just grab this and I'm gonna go. Uh, but you know, f thank you for everything, Ma. I don't, you know, I, I, uh, um, I, I love you. And he kind of like blushes with his reptile <laughs> blush. And he, like, picks her up and gives her a bear hug. Yeah, she doesn't resist at all. She leans into it. She's like, I love you too, Lorco. You take care of yourself. I'll, I look forward to hearing about all the different prey you've hunted and beaten up on old Krez. You can give her one for me as well. Oh, we are looking forward to that part. Ugh. You make sure you look after yourself. Those bloody, uh, whatever they're called, bastards come and get you, maybe, but... I think you could take care of yourself. Yeah, like to see him try. 
I had a yeah, little yeah. idea earlier. She gives you a wink and, like, using the toe of her, her steel-capped boot, she lifts up one of the boxes in your, your tent where you both sleep, and you can see she set up, like, a little snare trap with a crossbow ready to fire out of it. Oh, oh really? Oh, that's awesome. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> you just do what you do best, Lorcor, and you'll be fine. Those others are, are lucky to have you. I heard about people moving around yeah well I guess I'll just uh, keep them safe I suppose alright she gives you a, a peck on the cheek she says well I'll just say mm. see you soon I'll see you soon um, and all he picks up is this big ten foot chain and he just wraps it around his shoulder and wanders off oh he's so cool <laughs> Ah, oh, amazing. Uh, we'll go to... I can't resist. We'll go to Slug next. You find yourself in your little tent home that your parents have done their best to to kind of decorate and, and make homely. You're sat across um, from your mother and father at the little squat table and they're looking at you very seriously and your mother says... You want to leave? Yeah, Miss the Bushkin. He said I could go uh, on a trip. But your father's like a trip. Yeah, it's important because we've got to uh, find something new for the town. He kind of stammers, and your your mother puts a, a, a calming hand on your your father's uh, elbow and just says. I, Willie, you're... You're not... You're, you're 13. Yeah, I know. I'm ready to hit, go out on the t world to find some treasure and bring it back for everyone. <laughs> He's writing a note as well for to put in the den. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> she's, she's kind of um, taking it slightly better than, than your father. But it's like... Uh, and... You say you, you won't be going alone. You'll be going with Tiberius and the, the law core, is it? It seems quite strong. And um, the uh, the mushroom man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll be safe with them. Guys looks to your father, who is frowning heavily. He says, well, you've got your, um... He, he actually smiles. Your powers. So you know you can defend yourself if you need to. It's a dangerous world out there, Willie, and you got to strike first sometimes, rather than... <laughs> yeah. Rather than um, wait for someone else to strike. Oh, I know. And he hits his stick on the table. <laughs> Your great grandfather used to tell me stories about, you know, powers handed down, but, well, kind of jokes, jokingly smiles. Uh, nothing ever happened with me or my father and. I just, just don't want you to get hurt. All right, Dad. Your Bye. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom is like, wait, wait, wait. You must promise me to stay safe, comb your hair, brush your teeth, make sure you're eating well and sleeping properly. Oh, I will. Don't. Drink lots of things. Don't try, don't drink anything Tiberius gives you. And well, I, I'll I'll get your pack together. She goes off, and you can see she's getting a little bit teary. Just like Pokemon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Play the Pokemon theme. Um. 
Yeah, and you're, you share a moment sitting kind of silently with your dad. And he says, I know you like that stick, but, um, well, gets up, goes to above the, the, the boxes where you guys keep your, your meager clothing. He takes from behind them the, the woodsman's axe that he has there. He brings it back and he's just like, puts it on the table and scrapes it forward towards you. I know it's a bit big, but I want you to be able to defend yourself. What if your powers switch off or something? Yeah, that's a good point. I better take an axe. <laughs> Just, you know, and he kind of mimes a big, like, lumberjack swing. If I can cut down a tree, you can cut down anything horrible that's out there. I'm looking at this, uh, this axe quite doubtfully because it's like, why is it so big? <laughs> yeah, it's fucking huge. <laughs> but he, he stands up. He hasn't taken it back. He's left it on the, the little table in front of you. He's just like, sniffs. Right, well, um, <clears throat> if you, um, just, you could, you can always come back. Whatever happens, I won't let any, any of those fixers do anything, all right? All right, I'm sure I'll be back because I need to bring back the treasure. Has a moment where he's like, yep, my son's 13. Um, <laughs> your mother comes back in and begins fussing over you, getting you ready. Um, you can see she's quite teary, but keeping herself busy to to deal with it. Um, and as you're, you're heading off, your your parents kind of walk with you to, to gather you with the group. So we'll head over to uh, Henry Mush. Yeah, he's saying goodbye to Chuck yeah, and your he's, acolyte. He's gone to Chuck's garden and he's like, "I've got to go on an adventure." Chuck smiles a big smile and she says, "Ship." Um, I don't know yet. Maybe. Her. What did he say? <laughs> care. Said with like affection, oh, like take, yeah. take care. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be real careful. Yeah, he, his uh, <laughs> one of his uh, pseudopods reaches out, and you see the delicate mm. miniature ch tendrils reach out into his his crop of mushrooms, and he picks almost like a little bouquet of mushrooms of different colours and growths and holds them over to you, Henry. Oh, thanks, Chuck. You're the best. Worst. And a tendril pokes you in the middle of the chest. <laughs> or Agatha's <laughs> chest. Yeah. <laughs> the two acolytes are there as well, and Herbert's choked up immediately. Just like, what am I going to do without you, boss? Gotta tend to the garden. Oh, I can do that. I'll I'll tend to it every day. Oh, thanks, Herbert. That's real swell of you. And little pig bum is taking it in a in a very different way, and quite angrily crossed his arms, and he's just like, "We've still got so much to do here." I'm not stopping you. He, like, angrily grinds a little bit of dirt under his foot and then just immediately, like, leaps to you, Henry Mush, and hugs around your disgusting form. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, little pig bum. You'll be fine without old Henry Mush. And I set fire to the fixer's stuff while you're away. Only if it gets real bad. Alright, real bad. And here, uh, I, I have some extra seeds to see you on your way. And he'll 
shoots seed pods at him. Hell <laughs> yeah. Like a mother bird feeding the baby bird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 Herbert has a religious <laughs> religious revelation look on his face just like and my turn too of course <laughs> <laughs> and I think with their still alive bodies struggling to deal with the infection they both like pass out like r victims of religious ecstasy upon uh, the soil in Chuck's garden and Chuck just smiles at you and says, Shrooms. Yeah, it's better if they're asleep when I'm going, otherwise they'll be too sad. I've got to get something though from the garden. And he'll wander through and he'll search the garden for his big log hardwood. Ah, oh, yeah. You find, after a few moments, because Chuck does like to shift stuff around, but you find hardwood in pride of place with a beautiful crop of grey-capped mushrooms that grow quite short but wide, right up at the side of, of faithful hardwood. Yeah, he'll be like, hello, hardwood! Oh, did I lag out? No, you're good. Oh, yeah, he just say hello, 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 hardwood. Is hard, hardwood meant to be responding? I thought we agreed that he, he just goes. Oh yeah. Yeah, he just says, "Glad to see you've been keeping well." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, he's just gonna, he's just gonna take him and then go find the rest of the group. How did everyone manage to make such immediately legendary characters? <laughs> it breaks my brain a little bit. Okay, and then finally, Tiberius, what do you do to to say goodbye? He go back to his tent, gather up what meager supplies he has. Yep. He poke his head into his mother's tent. He like. I'm on my way now, mother. You might not see me for a few weeks, but um, that is to be expected. Isn't she deaf? Yeah, she yes, continues she sewing, facing away from Tiberius, not She's knowing like, any difference. So, like, mother! <laughs> <laughs> with enough volume, she kind of turns around and with a big smile, she puts down her sewing and comes over to you, gives you a big hug, and then you've developed a rudimentary sign language between the two of you and she even asks though, what's even going she's on. not crying he was like i have to leave now it's too much we did so well i didn't do it but um the lizard man did it he murdered a person and now we have to go and save the settlement he just smiles <laughs> and nods enjoying the look of you <laughs> enthusiastic and dramatic signs just saying uh, where are you going Away into this, into the deep, dark lands of Asari. He reads your lips, kind of rolls her eyes slightly, pinches your cheek, just says, The Sari aren't signs, Sari not all bad. Kind of like, he'd look at her and be like, I'll try and keep my wits about me, mother, but when I see you there, those marks on their flesh, it just makes me so angry. She has a mother's understanding smile and toddles over to her her sewing and she signs not finished, but she holds up. She's been making you a little, um, like, flag's the wrong word, like a crest on, on a little um, embroidered backing um, made to look like the Lord Quivershank's crest, which he has on the outside of his tent. He would like kiss the top of her head and be like, "If I were, if you weren't my mother, I would marry you, mother." <laughs> and then, um, like, he signs the word "weird," <laughs> but smiles. Do for now. I better go say goodbye to father. Yeah, she. As you go to move out, she like grabs your wrist for a second and then just holds holds you by your wrists. Um. 
just gently and kind of takes a moment to look over your face and then a couple of moments pass and she kind of smiles and nods and and gives you a kiss on the cheek and goes and sits on her bed. He'd like to spend a moment looking at his mum and he'd be like, oh, that's what it's all for. And then walk away and go and knock on the door of, well, does he have a door of Lord he, do- he doesn't. He doesn't have a door, and actually, the Lord Quivershank, um, much to his partner's consternation, um, always has his tents, um, like covering flap open, because he wants his people, um, that he still sees as his people, uh, to be always able to talk to him. He'd peep his head in. He'd be like, <gasps> "Knock, knock." Yeah, and you'd see Lord Quivershank there, um, even at this late hour, fully busy with his. His hobbies and you'd see slumbering in the back just a, a pile looking almost like a pile of clothing and duvet um his partner snoring away um but oh. as as you say knock knock um the lord turns to you and just says ah oh, tiberius big smile what brings he would, you it, here he'd go down normally he's like my lord it is a pleasure to see you as always. Oh, come, come, Tiberius. You know I don't like that. Up you get. Come and have a look at my paintings. He grabs you by the shoulder and leads you over to his paintings. And you can see he's been doing a, a number of <coughs> nude portraits of his partner. <laughs> he just and they're all laid them. out. Beautiful, beautiful, my lord. Um, You really did well for yourself, didn't you? He smiles and kind of nods. It's like, yes, I really think I've captured his um, spirit with this. Um, But, ooh, I haven't shown you my pottery. His eyes have moved down to the groin and be like, (laughs) you certainly did. (laughs) (laughs) He kind of bustles over to another side of the tent and picks out these very amateur, um, working with terrible, like, like, mud clay that he's put together um but he's like carved in some little bits and pieces one looks like a three-year-old's carving of like a bird and he just holds it up with a big smile on his face it's like don't hold back now tell me what you think oh my lord they're beautiful it really captures the um does he know it's hespian or shattered isles oh the bird yeah (laughs) it literally looks like like that where's this oh we're we not on that thing yeah on the map have i done on, on the wrong layer no we're on, you're on the wrong map you're on the uh, map. oh it's because of the dynamic lighting let me move it Ooh. oh no it isn't. can't let you not see this master yeah that was dumb of me in the dynamic lighting bit like that. Oh God! Yes, my lord, you really captured the um, the uh, contrast between the background and the forefront. Oh, you've always been so enthusiastic about the arts, Tiberius. It gives vigor to my old veins. Why don't well, you have it? And he kind of presses it into your chest. My lord, I could. No, oh, please. Uh, it just gives me an excuse to make another one. I'm going to have another pottery day coming up in a few days. You must attend. Well, my lord, I, I can't. Uh, Pushkin has um, me and a few others of the more talented in the village who aren't as, you know, not as old as you. Otherwise, I'm sure you would have been chosen uh, to go out and try and make some make make this great settlement even better oh, how exciting uh, this is cause for celebration uh, nortwin and he goes like hobbling over to the the pile of clothes and you see his partner nortwin uh, irritably kind of try and wave him away he was sleeping it's like, oh, where have we got the wine? I know we've got some left. Nortwin's like, we haven't got any wine left, Ernst. It's been a long time since we've had any. 
And Ernst is like, ah, rubbish! And goes, like, rummaging around his tent. Oh, my lord. When I come back, I'm, I'm sure I'll have some wine that we can share. We can... We can celebrate my homecoming, not the, um, not the going away. I'll make sure I have the best for us. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll, we'll make a banner. That's what we'll do. We'll make a banner. We'll gather some feathers, and I'm sure the Sari wouldn't mind if we had a little expedition. Get some berries. We can make a big banner that says, Welcome home, Tibby. Oh, my lord. You were so kind to me. <clears throat> but, um, we're doing this for the greatness of New Sh- Quivershank. You, you, you set the first steps, and well, I have to follow in your footsteps now, don't I? Do an excellent job of it, Tibby. I always think the, the joy you give to people with your songs, it's just. I wish I was a singer like you, but. My talents have always laid elsewhere. And he gestures grandly <laughs> to the violin, piano, like all these different discarded instruments. And you hear a little good-natured scoff from Nortwin in the bed. He put his um, hand on the Lord and showed him. He's like, I've always taken the stories he told me about Elsie to heart. And, well, I feel like I'm doing the... I'm trying to do the job she should have done here. Maybe this is what this journey is about. Redemption. Ernst places his hand on top of yours, and there's a solemn solemnity to, to his gaze in his old eyes as he looks at you, Tiberius, full on for a moment, and just says, We can't ever be Elsie, Tiberius. She was a unique wonder. But, um,. I think she'd be very proud of what we're doing here, and, well, she was always a, a safety first uh, lady, and uh, you'd do well to, to think the same. I, I don't want to make a, a big old banner, only for us to never use it, so make sure you come back. Oh, my lord, and don't. Um... There's a young child going with us who is gifted in the magical department. His name is Willy Nilly. I hope he will be represented on the side. Of course. It's always a good idea to take some children when you're founding a new settlement. We did that on the Quiver Sail. Well, look how well it turned out. Yes, um, you made a whole new culture and a whole new people here, my lord. It is truly beautiful. It is my greatest work. I, I don't miss it, you know, back in Hespio. All that money and all that uh, culture and civilization. But just just holds you back, weighs you down. Couldn't well, have made maybe, these back there. He well, maybe, paintings. maybe with this new expedition, we can create a new culture that surpasses that of Hespia. We have... What we have, but we we can always make it better. He kind of spaces out for a, a second at the end of your your speech, <laughs> and, and then kind of comes back in. He's like, "Yes, well, uh, must be getting on. I've got to finish my latest work, and Nortwin is a terrible model, aren't you, Nortwin?" From which you hear just a grunt of sleepiness from the bed. He looks at the paint and he's like, I don't think he's that bad, my lord. <laughs> Very good. Perhaps you could pose for me sometime. My lord, I would be more than willing, but I have work to do. Maybe when I'm back and maybe you can get a pic. Well, maybe you can do the whole troop who are going abroad. Um, the young mushroom man, Henry, willy nilly and... Uh, the lizard man, who is, uh, well, he's, he, he's strong. He has excellent musculature. Yes, I've seen him around, quite the specimen. Um, Mushroom Man? You, you mean Agatha? Yes, or Henry, as they like to call it. I'm not really sure. But I tried to have this conversation earlier, but it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> she was a funny one. I know the village didn't really like her very much, but um, I always thought she had a a good heart in there. Um, shame There's about the whole. There's certainly something in there, my lord. <laughs> shame about the whole sprouting a mushroom thing, but uh, maybe well, the mushroom will surpass the corporeal being. Maybe, maybe, and you know. You see a smile like that, you can't help but smile right back. Exactly. Well, if there's any news, um, look, take care of Pushkin for me. I know he needs you. Oh, well, Pushkin doesn't need anybody else, but of course I will check in with him almost every day. I see that old rascal. You know, he helped me with the, the stampede. He told me, and I said to him, maybe I can go out there and do as well as the Lord did. Very good, and oh, don't forget your pot! And he picks up a completely different pot and presses it into your chest. Thank you, my lord. I will use it to store my rations. <laughs> good day. Goodbye. I adieu. See you later. All that. Yeah, and as you walk away, you hear him saying to Nortwin, What a strange fellow! <laughs> as he goes back to painting. And then it's like, oh my dada. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. So as you find yourself all gathered, um I'm sure you were expecting as much you, as um Slug has walked over by his parents. You get a stern <laughs> a stern look from uh Father Nilly um to each of you and the mother uh kind of reels things off much like she did to, to slug himself of you got to make sure he combs his hair each day it will just become completely unmanageable and he's got to brush his teeth and i know we don't have anything but i've give, made a little bag of leaves he can use these some if he chews them it helps his teeth otherwise he gets all moany about it and there's sometimes he gets a bit of a rash on his bottom and if that happens, you have to make sure he doesn't sit down too much. He spends all his time in that den. And she just goes on and on. Kind of stood there saying this to Tiberius, I a mushroom him, man like... and <laughs> Lorcor. I'm sure Willie can massage his own bottom. He doesn't need anyone else doing it. <laughs> well, he doesn't complain when I'm doing it. She <laughs> smiles at you, Willie. Willie does not smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've made him this up, and she walks over to you, Lorcor, with this yeah. like massive backpack, and she holds it up to you. Kind of just like with two claws, picks it up. <laughs> Am I meant to carry this? Well, he can't carry it. He's only thirteen. Then perhaps there's too much in it. No. <laughs> I assure you, I packed it myself. Double checked it. Then I just puts it on the table. Okay. I very to pick it up and put it, put it in his pack. And just be like, oh, mother's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with tears in her eyes, she gives you an embarrassingly long smooch on the forehead. Slug. And your father <laughs> gives you a... a an overly masculine pat on the shoulder. It's just like, oh, don't forget. And he's he's made you like a little leather, almost like a bandolier or a sash, um, with a a, a loop of leather on the back to keep the the large woodsman's axe in it. Ideal. <laughs> And you notice as he puts this on you and puts the axe in it that the axe like scrapes the the bottom of the the haft scrapes along the ground and knocks along the ground behind you. And they're like, "Well, keep him safe." Or, "Well, there is no war. You keep him safe." Sure, a boy of his prowess can do himself very well, and he'd like. Pat his hair very warily. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Willy. I'll look after him. Thank you. 
the father's just like staring at you, Henry. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you? <laughs> But yeah, they wave you goodbye, Slug, and the four of you begin to head off into the night. Packs on your back, everything with what you're doing. Yeah, please go ahead. Henry would look down to Slug and say, I can't wait to outgrow my mum one day. (laughs) (laughs) Would Slug respond at all? He doesn't quite know what to make of that. (laughs) Completely reasonable. Oh, Jesus. And with that, I will call our first session to an end. Oh, my God.